FM, Hagaya, Guam. You're listening to The Link with Chris and Sabrina on Breeze 93.9. Breeze 93.9 FM. Yes, I. Soldier, 
Chris and Sabrina with The Link, The Link here on Breeze 93.9.
Antes de o hum hum niga Razzalz an malak estredzas Tu reddin todo e me mu A a no gui distancia Como gu pu gui palo Zangi man malak kofi I konu na sugi airi Preba tula nuci Nai penderata gaigi Pues Atten fanny bandera Ko ista po kwa puma la la pa Gilo ta no man libri Zen ta mi ti man ko
that feeling made you oh so glad? Have you ever had that feeling? The memory of our land. So here we go now, here we go. Here in Monkey Music, here we go now, feel the flow. Yinini Mastakilu, Hina Soku, Yinini Mastakalu, Ikura Son. And he must be good And he knows in Yahoo Who confess in my sadhu Out of my protein And defend me Good morning, Sabrina Salas Matanani. Good morning. Good morning, Jason. Rise and shine. There you not go. One, not one or the other. They're not mutually exclusive. You got to do both. Yep, it's a combo movement. Uh, Joe, sir, good morning. Combo mo- <laughs> Compound movement. That's what they call it. Yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful morning. Sure is. Uh, sunrise was gorgeous coming from the east side. East side. What did my boy Chase say this morning? 
said, how's that? It's so beautiful. He said, yeah, it's cool colors. Um, very beautiful sunrise this morning. It's another day. It's Thursday, not Friday. <laughs> one, one day closer. To I know. Day. I don't know. I feel like I lost a day in the week. I thought it was Friday. Uh, 622, this is the link. You're the only guy I know that has like holiday hangover <laughs> from last week. <laughs> yeah, from the last week. Through my whole schedule. I was a finely tuned machine, Jay. What did uh, you guys do yesterday in your in your leisure time? Like our, after our shift? Oh, our ended. leisure time. Well, uh, funny story. I uh, loaded all the trash to go to the dump. Nice. Dumps closed on Wednesdays. Ouch. Yeah. So funny. Um, then we went to the farm and picked some laguana, some soursap with my two boys. Oh, nice. Yeah. Good times. Good times. Uh, how about you? I well, you know, because it is it is Pride Month, right? I've been going right. on like the. Oh, is this it, Jay? Is this the moment? No, no, I've been, <laughs> but I've been, I've always enjoyed, you know, LGBTQ like cinema. I mean, you know, big movie fan as we all are, right? But uh, on the streaming services, like I've I've been on uh, Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime is there has a Pride a, collection? Has a great curated list of oh, wow. of, of Pride Month centric movies. So like I mean, you know, I give me some ideas. Tangerine, which which was a movie that was um it was Tangerine. I want to say they did this maybe like five six years ago, but the entire movie was shot on iPhones. Okay. On iPhone nine. I so believe what it makes it like LGBTQ um, plus? It's about I mean it's it's kind of like a really dark comedy about a um about a transgender prostitute and what sh- what she goes through over the course of an afternoon in the seedy part of downtown LA and it's it's very very good. So it's a documentary. No, it's like like a mockumentary. Oh, uh, it's, it's like, a mockumentary. Yeah, but but it's kind of oh. like it's real time and you know and then uh, Amazon Prime they've also got, you know, they got Brokeback Mountain of course. They've got The Birdcage which, you know, I've watched The Birdcage probably like 3 dozen times and it's What's always What's that guy's hilarious. name? Nathan Nathan that was a lot of people's first introduction to Nathan Lane. People yeah. who aren't familiar with like his work on the stage. He's a theater guy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And that's, that's of course that's before um cuz he was in uh, Lion King too, right? Yeah. Now Bro- Brokeback Mountain which is phenomenal. So well, yeah, there's a lo- lot of really really good um LGBTQ films that you can check out, you know, for, to celebrate Pride Month. Well, good on you. Thank uh thank you for the support. Uh Jay, there's also a movie locally I think that they're going to be making. Uh, I'm not sure if we reported on this, but the Rain Valdez Oh, yeah. Who's a transgender Simon Sanchez high school graduate? Yes. They're going to be doing a transgender movie on Guam. Um, Very cool. Yeah, I think they're just uh, finalizing it. Cause she, had, she was part of some contest or something. I'll, I'll Google it and we'll get it on. So, yeah, there's going to be another movie. Uh, you know, Operation Christmas Drop? Yep. And then we're going to do this one. I believe it's uh, the synopsis was something like... Uh, there's a high school ten year a ten year high school reunion, and then uh, she ends up coming back and fulfilling her dream of becoming a Simon Sanchez Sharks cheerleader. Really, nice. Yep. Yeah, so that's uh, in the works. All right. Well, d- so if you talk about LGBTQ plus uh, movies, well, that's definitely going to be one. And my senior year at Simon Sanchez High School in 1992, maybe our, you could get cast as like an alum or our, you know our ch- our cheerleader captain was also our prom queen. Wow. Well, yeah, there because, you go. because the uh, our star running back, he was he was the prom king. Nice, uh, six twenty six. Okay, wait. Speaking of film shot on Guam, Bree, what was that? What was that film that that all of us like in media, especially us here, wound up covering for like the better part of like a year? Max Havoc. Yeah, Max yeah. Havoc, Curse of the Dragon. Remember that, everyone? Hey, Carmen Electra's <laughs> on Guam. <laughs> oh, there you are, Bree. Remember what a dumpster <laughs> fire that wound up being? Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> Did you ever watch it? I don't think I even ever watched it. But I, re- I remember I like I tried to. Maybe we need to bring it back. You oh. know what I mean? Let this younger oh. generation appreciate it. Okay. Jo- well, Joseph said he actually went out when they, when they shot that one now famous scene um, on Tumon mm-hmm. Beach. I want to say it's right in front of like where uh, the Dusitani now is. Okay. The quarantine facility now. Um, so Joseph went out there and he shot that. And I remember when he came back. Um, I was like, Joel, how was it? You saw Carmen Electra? He's like, dude, she's short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Carmen is like, what, 5'2 or something like she's that? She's short? I didn't have any idea. But I mean, Matt, it was like for, I mean, because, you know, we all covered this and they said this was going to be such a huge driver. Yeah, for, we got taken for a ride. Yeah, dude. well, it was going to be such a huge economic shot in the Who arm. was the governor at that time, Bree? When? Who was the governor at that, that was time? Felix, right? During Max Havoc? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think it was Felix. I think oh, okay. it was Governor Camacho, yeah. Right, but. Yeah. yeah, you're right. And yeah. they're like, it's going to bring a gajillion dollars to Guam. And and at the time, it just did not like pan out. It was a know, sucky it was, movie, that's it, all. Well, yeah, and yeah, it was, was seen as like, you know, straight to video, which, which yeah. you know, at that time. Nowadays, it would have went straight to Netflix. Yeah, no, and you know what? And, yeah. and it would have been one of those things, like I predict, as bad as it was, it probably would have gone straight to the streaming services and would have been so bad, it would have been good. It would have trended. Like Sharknado. Yeah, that's what that's what I mean. Maybe we need to put it out and just embrace its badness. Yeah, but remember, this was supposed to be the next big thing because Guam is. We're going to say now we've got tourism and we've got movies, a film, you know, a filmmaking economy, and that kind of like you know fell by the wayside for a few years. But yeah, if Rain Valdez is coming out and planning to do that again, super in support of that. That is fantastic. Yeah. Um, Yeah, there was at one time. Remember when there was this whole like discussion that they wanted to make Guam like a film capital of the region this is at the time when like the munia brothers were hot and uh you know and then oh i, f- I forgot his name but the gentleman he's uh, I, uh there's he's, a gentleman no he's um you know he would come out and he would give uh, uh, um, alex Munoz. alex, alex Munoz. Munoz. yeah, yeah, yeah right, thank right, you right, he would yeah. he would come out and he would give these filmmaking workshops here about about cinematography how to shoot how to you know like do direction the financing right, yeah. you know the whole dance you got to do for that um that that was really, really interesting. And I wonder if Carl Gutierrez now, with his hat as the permitting czar, <laughs> if he's thinking, you know, th- this is something that we could really capitalize. Because, you know, like when Sabrina and I went to New York City, you know, you can take like selfies until you're like blue in the face. And everybody does, you know, when you're right. like Times Square and everything like that. What a lot of people don't realize is if you do anything commercially in New York and you, you don't a have a permit, yeah. oh, you are in some deep yeah. doo-doo. Yep. That's, I mean, that was hot talk for That's how they make money. They they make a ton of money. They kind of petered out. And I think like the Mooney brothers are now working for PBS or something. So it it just never really. Well, Don is like their head of production, I believe. Right. Went anywhere. Um, But I think the problem with the movie thing was that it sounded almost like too good to be true. And in a lot of cases, what ends up happening is these locales, like let's say Guam, for example, is we would just be so desperate to attract these movie making people and the movie making people are going to play off like, Oh, we could go here. If we don't get like a, you know, million dollar tax cut, then we're just going to go over here. So it ends up being something where you like sass at yourself so much that it ends up not really making any money for Mm -hmm. um, the Island. But I guess the the argument is that you get the shine from the movie. Well, it's gotta be a pretty big movie to shine. And to be (laughs) fair, you know, in, I mean, this is something I know like a thing or two about in, in the movie making industry. Mm -hmm. If you are one of the financiers of, of a major motion picture or, you know, just like any film, it's a real, real crapshoot. I mean, all the, the, the probabilities basically say that you are going to lose money unless it's like some huge breakout hit. And kind of the popular line that people like in the movie making industry use is that if you invest in a movie, you're not investing in it, uh, you know, to get your money back. You're basically in, you're throwing this this project a ton of money so that you can go to uh, the red carpet party and rub elbows with Matt Damon or Selena Gomez or, you know, any of the A-listers and everything like that. Right. If, if, you're, if you're doing it consistently to make money, you're probably not that savvy an investor. Well, thanks, Jay. Thank you for that. Uh, Six thirty-one. The show is proudly brought to you by Pacific Points, IT&E, Jack in the Box, Calvo Enterprises. On this Thursday, June tenth, twenty twenty-one. Here's who's coming up on the show. We'll catch up with the Krang, uh, Frank the Crank, who's out and about and up and at him after uh, being oh, involved good. in a, a multiple car crash on the freeway. Uh, also, Mark Scott, the Guam Guard, we're getting Maria Pangolina a little catch up here as they're uh, putting the finishing touches on their comparative uh, analysis election report. Uh, mayor Paul McDonald again, you hi. So I wanted to bring on the mayor because yesterday, Bree, during that press conference, you, through a great line of questioning, were kind of able to narrow down this second incident that Nicholas, uh, murder suspect Nicholas Moore was involved, when, involved in, and it was like an attempted murder charge, uh, Bree. Right. We had heard that uh, there was a drive-by shooting in Agania Heights in October, I believe it was, and that um, uh, Moore may have been uh, the gunman in that. But, right. you know, the chief didn't really confirm anything. He so. said, uh, I believe what he said was like, we don't publicize the name of the victim if they survived the incident. 
Right, but I wasn't asking for the name right, of the victim. Yeah. I was yeah. just asking if that particular case was in relation to, to that uh, drive-by shooting. Right, and I don't recall, Bree, I mean, was this something that uh, came out publicly when it happened? I don't remember covering a drive-by yeah. uh, shooting in Agani Heights. At the basketball court, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think of, we can ask the mayor about it, right? So yeah. we'll see if he knows anything. Yeah. He does, he does. So he was like, yeah, I'll come on. Also, Mayor uh, Louise. I'm Rivera. sure he does. <laughs> hey, well, you know what? If if I if I can just add on, yeah, on a, probably he does. If there's drive by shooting in his village, it maybe might have known about it by and, by his office. Yeah, mm, probably. Yeah, and if I could just add on a much more positive note about Agana Heights and everything, shout yeah. out to the staff at the Agana Heights Mayor's Office because Sabrina and I um, were there this past weekend because uh, the Agana Heights Mayor's Office hosted um, the, the Tomato Festival. Yeah, the right. presentation of that. And they, they were unbelievably gracious and accommodating and hospitable. Um, they gave awards to, like, all of these kids who worked so hard. And Bree, Bree and I were absolutely blown away because the, the winner, well, I mean, there, there were several winners, but the winner in one category was a young man named Connor Gibbons, right, Bree, whose, whose tomato plants yielded, get this, Chris, 110 tomatoes there's got to be some that something there's something up with and that, his right? fa- his father was like no he's never done this before <laughs> he's 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 not he's not a farmer he just you know he's i demand an investigation he's a very hard working young man and he, right. he said he you know he 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 lined up everything he did some research let me ask you this though guys so how was that because it was kind of like a ceremony thing and that was probably like the first outdoor public ceremony that you guys have been to what was it like with the protocols and whatever Everybody was wearing a mask. Right. Um, everybody was. I mean, you know, there were a couple a couple points when they're like, "Hey, let's go take a picture real quick." Everybody, and then er- and then the chief judge Francis Tyvinko Gatewood was like, "All right, and now let's like safely disperse." Right. But they wanted to do something to you know mm-hmm. give the shine to the kids who worked so so hard and everything. But I mean, I was I was nervous going there when Bree and I were like driving up um, at how many people were gathered. It was what Bree maybe like what two dozen maybe. And still, I was like, yeah, little, it wasn't a whole lot of people. Yeah, I was still a little bit nervous, but as soon as we got down and you know, the, like the thing started, I was running around like taking pictures. I was very, very comfortable. Nice. Yeah. So, so shouts to the Agana Heights Mayor's Office for Shoot. for a fantastic event. shout out Agana Heights Mayor's. It was Office. it was actually hosted by uh, the district court right. and the uh, Department of Agriculture. Yeah, judiciary and nice. it was there. It was the Law Month Planting Contest. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, our friend Chelsea Munya Breck, the director of Department of Ag, is calling us out because she's like you know we have to do we have to do this more often and we're gonna this was for the kids we've got to start doing like adults are uh, we gonna do a cannabis challenge no no <laughs> i mean you said adults well the That's planting all. challenge and what, what do you think brie and i said i said hey if, if there's it ever, takes a little longer they're to gonna grow. have another another uh planting contest yeah Yes. For the court, right? It's gonna, is it going to be something different, like eggplant or That's what she was saying. She's peppers. like, she wants to do something. Di- I was like, hey, if there's like, a star apple competition, I'm the first man up. Yeah. But uh, but the, it's star apple takes, what did they say, three years to grow, so right. it's yeah. not happening. Mm. We need something with a little quicker turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, Sabrina, of course, is teleworking from Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, Bree, just a little catch-up. We had some listeners asking about uh, how you're, how's everything going out there. Uh, it's, it's fine. I, I haven't uh, gone to the strip or anything. It's just here and, you know, to the hospital back and, you know, work right. and back to the hospital. So it's pretty much what I've been doing. <laughs> right. Uh, 636. Also, uh, minority leader, uh, Senator Chris Duanius is going to jump on uh, this morning. Are we get him on every other week uh, for an update. And so, yeah, add him to the thing. I forgot. Uh, good morning, by the way. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the news, Bree. From the very um, okay. from the KUAM news team, with the very latest on this uh, Thursday morning, it is uh, June tenth. Facebook Live, we see you, we see you. We're gonna come back and check you guys out after the news um, with Sabrina Salas Mantanani from the KUAM news team. Good morning, Sabrina. Off and everybody, trial is scheduled to get underway in the Superior Court of Guam for George Chamber Jr. He is accused of committing pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA fraud for allegedly submitting falsified records to receive PUA benefits during the pandemic. The driver of a car that fatally struck a four-year-old boy back in 2019 will see no jail time. Marlene Ewley entered a plea agreement admitted to the crime. She was indicted for vehicular homicide as a second-degree felony. According to KUAM News Files, four-year-old Jericho 
Chicago, Zion David was playing outside his home in Dedede when he fell on the road. According to the plea agreement, she faces a suspended five-year prison sentence with credit for time served. She was placed on a three-year supervised probation term. With more news, here's Tyler Matanani. When it's in half a day, everyone, I'm Tyler Matinani with your headlines here on The Link. No longer a missing person, 27-year-old Michael Castro's case has been classified to a homicide investigation. As 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore was picked up in the state of Florida and is being extradited back to Guam to answer to not only murder charges for the death of Castro, but also attempted murder for a separate case. For the past eight months, authorities provided no comments and no updates on the status of missing 27-year-old Michael Castro until Wednesday morning after the U.S. Marshal Service arrested 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore in Florida. Subsequently, the Office of the Attorney General and the Guam Police Department held an emergency joint press conference confirming Moore is suspected of murdering Castro and accused of attempted murder in a separate case. Chief of Police Stephen Ignacio. An extensive investigation into Michael Castro's disappearance was launched by GPD's Criminal Investigation Division. Through the course of our investigation, our detectives identified 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore as a person of interest in reference to the ongoing missing person investigation. According to Ignacio, as the case developed, GPD obtained both the local and federal warrant. Moore was nabbed by the U.S. Marshal Service Florida Caribbean Regional Fugitive Task Force and assisted by Bay County Sheriffs. At this time, Mr. Nicholas Moore is being held, and uh, it is our understanding that uh, he will be extradited back to Guam to answer to these charges. According to Chief Prosecutor Basil O'Malley, Moore will appear first in the District Court of Guam to answer to a federal warrant and then be prosecuted locally. It seems he will also be facing federal charges, explains AG Levin Camacho. A separate charge is fleeing a jurisdiction to avoid prosecution. So there is actually, that is a federal offense, and the U.S. Attorney's Office does have jurisdiction over that matter, and, and ultimately the, the U.S. Attorney's Office will decide how it wishes to proceed, but they're well aware that our office intends on prosecuting the, the murder and attempted murder charges here. Law enforcement was unable to comment on whether or not Castro's body has been located due to ongoing investigations. GPD was also limited on providing details regarding the second criminal case Moore is being held on. We also believe uh, that uh, Nicholas Moore was involved in another uh, incident which involved uh, the attempted murder of an individual uh, in the central area. Uh, again, because uh, there's a connection between Nicholas Moore and two cases, uh, we, we don't want to comment uh, beyond that. KUAM pressed for answers, but Chief Ignacio and AG Camacho didn't let up. Right now we're just trying to lay out these procedurally what's going on, but it, it, this is very much a, a live investigation and it is developing, I would say, almost daily uh, in terms of where we're going from here, but this is a very big first and significant first step. Castro's mother, Melanie Guerrero, who has fought endlessly for justice and continued to keep an open dialogue with KUAM, confirms that Castro and Moore knew each other. This case is ongoing. 25-year-old Melvin Sablon Leon Guerrero Jr. was arrested after allegedly sexually assaulting two young teens. According to a magistrate's complaint on April 22nd, a witness reported the incidents to police. Officers interviewed a 13-year-old victim who alleged that on March 22nd, she woke up to Leon Guerrero on top of her. He allegedly told her, quote, just let me do it. The victim was able to fight Leon Guerrero off after 10 minutes and he asked her not to tell anyone. Officers also interviewed a 14-year-old victim who alleged Leon Guerrero had been sexually assaulting her since she was 12 years old. She said that on three occasions between December 2020 through March of this year, she woke to Leon Guerrero pinning her down, sexually assaulting her. Leon Guerrero is facing three counts each of first, second and third degree criminal sexual conduct and attempted first degree criminal sexual conduct. The Department of Youth Affairs was among the agencies to go under the microscope Wednesday as the budget hearings continued. 
While DYA Director Melanie Brennan discussed her fiscal year 2022 spending plan, senators also wanted an update on a different agency she's also in charge of, Child Protective Services. The governor ordered the takeover of CPS by DYA back in January. She cited a crisis situation because of a huge backlog in cases. About half a dozen of DYA employees, including Brennan, are still at CPS. We continue to be there. We are trying to, as soon as a new warm body comes in for CPS, we're trying to switch off. And so we do anticipate three warm bodies coming in um, in June. But it has been difficult to recruit um, social workers for CPS. It's not an easy job. And sometimes we go through the whole recruitment process. We make a selection and they turn around and tell us, no, thank you. I found something else. Brennan admits it has been a struggle. She cannot say specifically when they would be relinquishing control over DYA. It could be August or even December. But she says she expects there will be a continuous relationship between DYA and CPS going forward. With regional headlines, here's KSPN2 News. Hoffa Day, Zantino Guam. Here's what's making headlines in the CNMA. A fire occurred early this morning at the Northern Mariana Seafaring Traditions Program Ut in Susupi, burning half of the roof and a canoe. John Costro says that many found out about the fire through a video that went viral on social media. But he says that when he arrived at the canoe house early this morning, he saw half the roof gone and just knew that something was wrong. As soon as I parked the car, I, I just stared and I, I was thinking, I was hoping, I'm dreaming. But unfortunately, that's the sad truth. It did happen. Kostro and his team has been working on this canoe for about two years now, and it was so close to a finish until this tragic incident happened. This week, we would complete the main hole. If you can look behind you, there's that one last plank that's going on this side of the canoe. And then we'll be done for the week uh, on the hole for this week. Then we jump over to putting the arms for the outrigger. And then unfortunately this thing happened, so we're back to, wow, I don't know, calculations, I don't know, in my head right now. His suspicion on how the fire started is this. The fire started on the south side, which is the leeward side, where the wind's not blowing at all. I, I believe somebody was here uh, resting and probably mosquitoes were getting to him or her and decided to smoke the mosquito out and end up fire running away because the only that's the only uh, assumption I can make because if this was done intentionally why not just start the fire in the middle of the canoe or start it from the windward side and let the whole place go. Canoe voyagers who worked on this project are deeply saddened, but Kostru says they are grateful for the words of encouragement from community members that has helped them to move forward. I'm trying to grasp the, you know, that, that, that saying that things happen for a reason, so I'm trying to accept what's the good side of this. So far, maybe it's too early to say, yeah, what's the good side, but... Uh, encouragements and uh, folks that are sincere about the project come by and uh, share their sentiments about the program and our bosses are uh, announced that we will continue so at least that side we're seeing the light on the end of the tunnel for more news please visit siphontv.com for kspn2 i'm sally Lemus. That's it for now. We'll see you tonight for KUAM News Primetime. See you tonight for KUAM News Primetime. As for the latest numbers, the Joint Information Center reports there were nine new confirmed cases of COVID out of 673 tests performed on Tuesday, seven of the, those cases were identified through contact tracing. To date, there have been a total of 8,224 officially reported cases of COVID-19 on Guam since March of 2020. There have been 139 deaths, 55 cases are active, and there have been 8,030 recoveries. A total of five people are hospitalized. Guam's CAR score is 0 0.5. A total of 85,023 residents have been 
fully vaccinated. The Guam National Guard, in the meantime, is ready to mobilize on-site vaccination clinics, similar to the outreach held at the Port Authority of Guam last week. The Guard can administer the COVID vaccine at work sites or for large groups of at least 50 people. For more information, you are urged to call 682 2172. With Governor Lulian Guerrero's announcement last week about the Vax to Win incentive program, we stopped by Operation Liberate Guam to see what push island residents to get immunized against COVID. After dealing with a challenging school year and not having social interactions with friends and family members, 13-year-old Chloe Matro and 17-year-old Sophia Matro of Zonia made their way to the UOG Fieldhouse to get their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. They share that getting vaccinated will be the way to some form of normalcy. I miss going out with my friends so I can, because <laughs> uh, my parents want me to, mm -hmm. yeah, and so I don't get sick. Aside from not being able to talk to friends, just having to stay at home a lot really just affected how I perceived how I wanted to treat my health because I didn't really like going out, but at the same time, I felt that I needed to exercise more. So yeah, I really had to challenge. 13-year-olds Marky Mapo of Dededo and Momong resident Gabriel Muenu shared why residents should get vaccinated. Please take the vaccine to be protected from the COVID-19. It's safe to best to get a vaccination so you could be safe from COVID. Operation Liberate Guam resumed administering COVID-19 vaccines to the community at the UOG Fieldhouse in efforts to get the island to reach herd immunity or 80% of eligible individuals vaccinated against the virus. Joint Task Force 671 Public Affairs Specialist Janine Guzman said that there has been a slight increase of residents getting vaccinated. She said it's hard to tell whether the increase is because of the incentive program. However, there are a lot of people receiving their first dose of the vaccine. According to a spreadsheet, last Tuesday, 748 vaccines were administered. Then yesterday, 791 individuals got vaccinated. That is 43 more people who opted to get their shots. Appointment bookings are still available here at the EOG Cavill Fieldhouse from 12 to 5.30 p.m. You can register online at tinyurl.com backslash vaxguam. Reporting for Guam's News Network, Guahusi Isaiah Uggen. President Biden is setting off on a more than week-long trip to Europe where he'll meet with more than 35 world leaders, ranging from the Queen of England to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Skylar Henry has more details from the White House. President Biden swatted away a cicada as he prepared to board Air Force One, and then he laid out his agenda for his European trip. Strengthening the alliance, make it clear to Putin and to uh, China that Europe and the United States are tight. The G7 is going to move. It's a jam-packed trip, starting with a meeting with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and then the G7 summit in Cornwall, England. He will also meet with Queen Elizabeth before heading to Belgium for a meeting of NATO partners to discuss defense spending, cybersecurity, and Russia. He's been getting ready for 50 years. Um, he has been on the world stage. He's known a number of these leaders for decades, uh, including President Putin and including a number of the leaders he'll see at NATO and he'll see at the G7. The headline stop of the trip will likely be the president's face-to-face -face meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, as both countries continue to be on opposite sides of most issues. Joe Biden is not meeting with Vladimir Putin despite our country's differences. He's meeting with him because of our country's differences. There is simply a lot we have to work through. The White House says the president plans to discuss a number of topics, including Russian aggression in Ukraine, election interference, and Russia's possible harboring of cyber criminals. The president downplayed expectations for the Putin meeting this morning. The relationship has been strained ever since their first meeting in 2011, when Vice President Biden told Putin he doesn't have a soul. Skyler Henry, CBS News, the White House. With more news in tomorrow, here's Kim Conception. Buenos dias, nak pergi setiap hari untuk bikin untuk semua orang di KUAM News. Perniagaan tanah yang familiar mitu di First Hawaiian Bank. Bandarnya ofisinan hendak dalam pegawai guaan jadi departemen tung polisia gini gam na organ permain sima masing permusion pada jemaah resta si Nicholas Wayne Moore di Florida.
i U.S. Marshal Service Task Force Guihi man matoto dani Bay County Sheriff's Office para makoni si Moore no toto guahan di Panama City Beach. If in the GPD, si Steve Ignacio a confit man na magata dan marista si Moore sa polifinay tay Michael Castro pentisya ti onis na idad. No ma report na malingo disti November gi mapos na sakan. Malilikaw po rito na kausan pinino loki dahil lang yung signature na sa inyo ay nakausa para may extradite si Moore at tatiguahan. Sigaw ni Chief Prosecutor si Basil O'Malley siyempre anong finit na si Moore ay District Court of Guam para opya di as kapag di iwari na federal basta doon na ba prosecute ni Inirad Abagadong Guahan sa polisi siya may mistiga ay STC ha na kausa. Tiga may ganang informasyon mga sa langno si GPD sa ni ofisina ni AG po di kausa dyan tamano na grado ng matungo si Moore dan si Castro. Gimas... Tuma preso si Marlene Ewelli po da susugo ni kareta no pinino ang 4 anos na pagong lahi gi 2019. Kumuntata si Ewelli para plea agreement sa admitin ang misawi. No rin ni por KUAM manday si Ewelli por vehicular homicide no segundo grado na felony. Sigo ni zon na plea agreement na fafanat 5 anos gi preso da masuspendi adzo. Zan na kredito po di sinaganya gi tribunal esta. Mapolo loko yung supervised probation para tres anos at kung makantradi sa kondisyon niya ato na probation, sinap makonik para ipresyo yung sigidas. Mas gini ni Kotti, may resta si Melvin Sablan Leongro Roo Jr. dispuesa ni mga atsake na manatakan bas ni Dos na Hubensita. I magistrates na complain na explica na gini dia 22 gaya bread makiyati si Leongro Roo gini GPD na gini siya lumii ibidan niya. May interview ni Ipulisia uno na tres anos na biktima no sangan na gi Matsu 22 mat matagi da staba si Leon Guerrero gi Hilonia sinangon di Leon Guerrero para usedi ha i minalago niya hamumuzi pad kon si Leon Guerrero da sumuha no gi des minutos sa tempo finaisen gi para mungo mesen gi pod ibdania may interview loki on 14 anos na pad kon no sangan na desti ane 12 anos gi na idad at tutuhun si Leon Guerrero is sexual assault contra guita Ilang yan na Trish Gaya di si Desembre gi 2020 na sakan is tayo matso na mers. Man matag wi anay na fesas dyan gineti papa as Leon Guerrero dya tutuhin na taklan bas ni. Afafan na si Leon Guerrero tres na kwentan primet dyan segundo grado na criminal sexual conduct dyan attempted first degree sexual conduct. Di mas asunto, Secretary of Labor si Marty Walsh ang manayong rato na conference and media para Western and Pacific na lugar na reporters gi Egan Metkulis at so gusti para explica yung manalik at the American Jobs Plan Mafaisin si Walsh kung siya confirma na guaha sa lapigin na the American Jobs Plan para guaha sa nipumalo siya na teritoryo ni Estados Unidos. Tia opi zo direktamento si Walsh. Doi leng niya na adzo na planu sa na masa de lanto dan na fakmalik adzo siya yung manbaba na infrastructure kung man na mas nwebu iti na tijing komunidad siya zo prepara ekonomiya para 21 na siglo. Mentos sa na guaha pun mizon mas na sotso union siya no sen maulik man manapasi. Yutu mo na suntu. At di USS Springfield sa mas mabu na summer rain ni pero agang guahan gumak niya. Binido ibat ko ni delgado ni Michael San Nicolas gi Naval Base Guam. Ilang yan ay natisa esti esta singko na summer rain guini. Hasangan na siga at kontinua para tanda mas medgo di tanota sa nindidefendi ni nasyon no esti siya na kapasidad summer rain no maabansa mas gi fetsan niya. At binido lo ko yung marino siya sa ni familia niya no natsasafu mas este na para iso gitano. 150 na marino manggagi USS Springfield. Este na batko no kategorian Los Angeles class fast track submarine sa gay kapasidad para supote mega na misyon siya tagi anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface ship warfare, strike warfare, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Para Guam News Network, Guam Second Conception. Yasunto yung finutsamuro sa prinsenta sa ninafato ni Familia Mizu gi First Hawaiian Bank. June makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. A fact not lost on Daryl, whose brother Byron is cooking the onaga he caught at a secret fishing spot with his girlfriend Malia, who used to work for the Shave Ice Guy, whose second cousin Vince drives the school bus ridden by Kalei, whose auntie makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. Everything here is connected, and with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. Welcome back, everybody. The link is here, and we are joined by a very, very good friend of ours who is uh, very fortunate to be joining us uh, as, of course, just to give you some context about what happened yesterday. Um, big news, our very good friends, Frank the Crank Camacho, uh, my cousin, and also Cookie Alvarez, his coach, uh, were training for UFC 263, uh, involved in a, I believe, a four-car uh, car accident on the 405 in California. And if you know anything about uh, traffic in the golden state that is a uh, very very busy bit of freeway there uh frank fortunately 
um, to come away from that with uh, with very minor injuries. So Frank is joining us right now in the, in the Zoom room. I want to let him tell the story in his own words. Uh, Primo, good morning, man. And I got to say, you know, prayers mm -hmm. up. Uh, we're really, really glad um, that you and Kuki are both okay. So welcome to the show. Yo, good morning, guys. Hello. Hi, Sabrina. Good morning. Good morning. And as we Man, understand it, you're, you you're not alone in your room as you do your uh, recuperation, right? Who else you got? Yeah, actually, so I, I just got to San Diego. Uh, I was I was in Irvine, and I just got to San Diego. And look who's joining us this morning. Oh. Hey! hey. Hi. Hi. Oh, she's smiling. <laughs> good morning, yeah, little one. So, oh. Yes, I mean it's it's uh it's two p.m. over here. So Sarah and Catalina just got up. You know, I just I just came in. Uh, I came in from Irvine. Um, they came in yesterday. So when all of this stuff happened, when I got into that that crazy accident, uh, they were they just boarded the plane on uh to Hawaii. So I was oh, wow. like, uh, well, first off, thank goodness that I was able, still able to text her and message her. Yes. Um. First off, the 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 accident was wild. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm man, I'm a, it, it really like strengthened the 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 belief of a of a higher power of the man upstairs of God or whoever. You know how how a lot of other people like to to you know to to think of of, of God, right? And man, he was up there and he was watching Cookie and I. Like we were. We were on the 405. Apparently, the 405 is is notorious for, uh, you know, like, I mean, you're 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 traveling at high speeds. You know, <laughs> you're not traveling. You're not you're not driving in yeah. Palanta and Zonia. You know what I mean? Like you're going, <laughs> you're going fast. You know, you're going like 75, 80 miles an hour. And uh, so something happened when we were driving. I was driving a, a truck, uh, a, a Tacoma, and all we heard was tires screeching. And then uh, we just uh, we were driving. I was driving, and then I got smacked on the, the driver's side uh, by this car that lost control, and the car just our truck like went forty five degrees, almost perpendicular to the to the uh, interstate. So we were drifting. As that was happening, oh this the, the truck slammed into the center um, concrete like a divider. And ricocheted off and flew over our truck hood, bro. Like that it flew over and it, and it just and it just missed us. Like it flew over the hood of the truck. It flew over the hood of the truck and then it checks. It landed on the Lamborghini, or on a Ferrari. It landed on a, a, a black Ferrari. And then as of all of this was happening, we were bird's eye view you know like we weren't seeing this like on the rear view mirror like it was happening in front of us so like it was we we're right in the mix cooking it. and uh uh so that was happening and then to the right of us it was like four or five lanes on the 405 man cars were just slamming boom boom spinning flipping and we were just there smoke metal were flying and all of this while this was going on cookie was like Stay in control, stay in control, Frank. Stay in control, Frank. I don't know what happened. It was like, uh, it was like I, I, I was just in hyper focus. I don't know, heightened senses of survive. I, I don't know what you want to call it. God, you know, there's it was, it was surreal, you know, and and we only got hit once. All of the, the debris, these cars were flipping, and somehow, some way, oh, shit, hold on. Ah, my bad. I'm getting excited telling the story. Uh, somehow, some way, we 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 just kind of jolt. We found like a little hole in all of this mm -hmm. chaos, and we we the truck, our truck came out, and then yeah. everything else behind us was like spinning. Cars were getting were crashing into each other, whatever, right? And then uh, I just pulled off like a uh, about a, a probably like a like four, quarter of a mile down the street, like uh, the freeway on the right side, and. Yo, you I was we were just tripping out. Like we were freaking out. And and the crazy thing was that like I, I just remember seeing my phone that they were that these guys were uh, my my wife and Catalina were boarding the uh the airplane to Hawaii, you know, to come out to watch me for my fight that's happening this weekend. That was supposed to happen this weekend. Mm -hmm. And Dude, I just remember I just started crying. I just started bawling, you know? Like, it, it was so weird. It was like, 
you know, man, motions and craziness. And Cook was just comforting me. He's like, hey, man, crank, it's all right, it's all right, man. And I was, and I just, I just said to him, like, I was like, wow, it's so crazy that, that, uh, so Catalina, she's uh, three months. Mm. Like, yo, like, she could have, she could have grown up without a dad, you know? She could have grown up not knowing me. You know what I mean? Like, um, and my boys, my boys would have only had a few years of knowing who who their dad was, you know. Like, uh, yeah, it was it was it was crazy. It was it was it was so surreal. And and I'm and I'm honestly I'm so I'm so glad that that cook that cook was cook was out there with me because I just picked him up uh, from the airport from Saipan, you know. And he was it was all good, you know. He, he was updating his stories and he was saying, "Hey, yeah. dude, like, hey, you know, just everything, you know, we." We had a good training session that morning. We went to go get headgear, and then this happened, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and the crazy part was, like, we were just talking about it. We laugh about it now, you know? Uh, like, or, like, not laugh about it, but we, 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 we talk about how he came out to corner me for a big fight, you know? He came out to corner me for a big fight, an important fight for my career when really... He was cornering me and coaching me through all that chaos of staying just to stay calm. And it was really the truthfully the fight of our life, like literally, you know. Um, so yeah, and you know, people are asking me, like, hey, how is like hey, who, who's the one that hit you guys? I'm like, man, honestly, I don't know. And 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 I really do hope that those guys are okay or even alive, man. It was wild. And then perspective it was even crazier was when i was when i googled it at the so it happened like at 4 30 p.m on monday uh here on here in california when i googled the to see the accident it, on the 405 six or seven articles came up of accidents during that time so it was just like wow this happens on a freaking daily you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and while we, you know, while I was in the hospital cooking it, we we're just talking about it. Like, you know, it's so wild, dude. Is that, you know, there's there's people and there's families mourning right now. You know, like, like, yeah, it's it's, yeah, it's, it's like, crazy. And we, yeah, and we came and you know, like, yeah. And when I when I got to the hospital, you know, we, uh, so we the the ambulance picked us up, picked me up, and Cookie came with me, and uh, I so when when I got hit. I, I slammed my head and my neck, like my neck, I guess a, a whiplash mm -hmm. on, uh, on the, you know, where you, where you pull your seatbelt, that, that thing on the car, that post on the car, like near the window, just went whack. Cause when we got whacked by the, um, by that big white truck that, that hit us, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so yeah. So when I got to the hospital that, you know, we, we, we they, they, they recommended that I got a CT scan just to check my brain, right? Make sure there's no bleeding, no nothing. X-rays to see that I, I didn't break any bones. So good thing was no broken bones with the X-ray. Brain was good uh, with the CT scan. Um, but the weird thing was with the CT scan, they saw that there was some inflammation on my spine and on my neck. So they ordered an MRI. And when they ordered the MRI, they saw uh, that I yeah, had like four herniated discs. So um i i now i'm just they recommended that i rest and then the next few days i'm going to start seeing like physical therapists and see some doctors you know while i'm out here and uh yeah so obviously uh when all of this was happening i, I messaged my manager you know we we spoke to the ufc and we we had to pull off from the fight right uh the, this weekend so um yeah the that's kind of the, the the spill yeah well crank you get, you're getting a lot of love wow. and a lot of support right now in our comments and people are saying you know like god is good and god god had your back and, and was watching out for you and protecting you so and you know as, as soon as we found out we immediately jumped on the show and we said you know you know we know frank's a family man he's a man of faith you know we, we all know his character and he prays for all of you so send your prayers upstairs for for frank and cookie too yeah you men and then cookie bro that guy's like a tank man he 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 didn't even get hurt you know so yeah. it really someone was really watching over us you know what i mean like you know it's kind of one of those one of those experiences where you you uh um you just kind of like 
I, I, I guess I just see, I'm seeing like life in it in it with a different lens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and so, um, Frank, Frank, can you bring, can you bring on Sarah? Cause I want to get like some of her perspective on what she was, you know, what she was going through because you said you were actually texting her in while yeah. you were in the ambulance and while she was in the air, right? Yeah, she was in the air. I was like, oh my goodness, you know, like uh, I was trying to stay calm, but um, yeah, yeah, hold on, she's right here. Say hey, hi. Sarah. Hi, everyone. Oh, okay, Sarah. Hi. Sarah, yeah, Sarah, we are so so glad, and our, our prayers offer your entire family and everything like that. But can you, if you don't mind, can you kind of take us back through? what you were going through and how you dealt with it. Because obviously, you know, Frank was saying, you know, he's thinking about you and the kids, but, you know, you're also thinking about, um, you know, your husband and the father of your children. And, you know, just with you guys being completely separated and yet still in communication and everything like that, what were you going through? So uh, when I received the word, I was, I had just landed in Hawaii and I didn't have Wi-Fi on my phone and I'm traveling alone with my baby. So of course, at that time, it was just kind of chaotic already. So um, fortunately, cause Endo was there. He was transiting as well. And he was helping me with my daughter and my, my auntie who works at Hawaii uh, airport. She was helping me too. So fortunately, I had a couple people with me. And so we were running through the gate, uh, the terminal, trying to get to my plane because I was running late. So it was just kind of chaotic already. And then I finally get there. I'm like running to the bathroom, doing last minute things, changing her diaper. Okay, they're calling us to board. And I, I just thought, man, maybe I should just hook up to Wi-Fi. Just I should just check my check my messages, tell Frank I'm I'm boarding the plane now. And I'll just do that. You know, it was just a last minute decision I decided to do. And so in the midst of all that chaos, I get on the Wi-Fi. And I instantly see a photo that Frank sent me and it, he was in a neck brace. That's all I could see. So I'm like, oh man, something must have happened during training. And then following that photo was a voicemail. And so I'm sitting there with my daughter and Cause is there, my auntie's there. And I'm while I'm listening to the voicemail, um, they're just kind of like, you know, helping me get, get my stuff together. And then I hear what Frank's saying. He's saying he just got into a car accident. So I'm just kind of like, wait, hang on, what's going on? You know, like my brain was still trying to process everything. My auntie's looking at me, she can hear Frank and she's just trying to calm me down, you know, like, okay, he's okay. He's telling you he's okay, just relax. And so um, it was it was pretty emotional, but it was, I was just so blessed that my auntie was there because she can, she's just kind of like, okay, Sarah, get it together. You still need to go to Denver. You still need to go to California. Your daughter needs you. Frank is fine. And and so I'm just so blessed that she was with me. Um, I really couldn't process everything at that moment because they were already calling me. And it was just, it was pretty crazy. And then I think I just had to, I remember just a point where I just looked down because my auntie took the baby and she was lying on her lap. And I was just kind of like, trying to figure out what to do, how, what's going on. Okay, so Frank, I, and all I can hear, right, because it's a voice, you know, he's just telling me what happened. I hear like the beeping of the, the machines in the background. So I really don't know at this point what happened, how he's doing, if he's okay, can he walk? Yes, he's alive, but what, what's the what's state? Um, so it was, it was pretty crazy. But at that point, I remember just looking down at my daughter and she's looking at me. She's just kind of giving me this look like, okay, mom, like what's going on? So she's like, you know she what? Knows. Whatever happened, Frank, Frank's okay. I just need to get there. I need to get my shit together because my daughter needs me and we have a long trip to go. So my auntie, she calmed me down. She's like, okay, Sarah, get it together. Get your stuff together. Your daughter, she needs you. So, you know, we're going to help you. She walked me to the front because she, you know, she works at the airport. And then I just kind of like gathered my thoughts and gathered myself and just pulled myself together and got on the plane. And it, it was kind of a rough ride, right? It was very packed. And there was a baby, a, a mama with a baby right next to me. And it was kind of like one of those rough flights, but I think it was good because it just was so distracting the mm -hmm. whole time. And I didn't really get to like sit there and, you know, 
be sad or whatever. I was just kind of like, okay, I need to, you know, she was ha- being fussy. The baby next to me was being fussy. And it was just kind of like, okay, get it together. You need to take care of the baby. You need to help the mama next to you, you know? And, and then we finally got here. And then I talked, I video time Frank. Good, you know, he was smiling. And I was like, okay, he's okay. He's fine. That's all that matters. And, you know, oh, it was great. I woke up super because I'm so jet lag and time. He was the one that woke me up. It was a way to wake up this morning and we're all together. He's fine. He's smiling. Well, Sarah, Sarah I got I got to tell you, I've, you know, we've known you for years here. You've been a very good friend, of, you know, to our company, to our team, to our show and everything. I'm I'm glad, you know, there wasn't any drama on the plane. And, you know, you had that support system and family, because if if you say if you sat next to a Karen, right, or somebody like tried to mess with you, <laughs> considering the emotional state you were in, with all due respect to your husband's fight record, you probably would have choked a few people out enough. Like, <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> You are so right. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot imagine. No. <laughs> I've seen no, uh, Sarah's was... training videos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it was it was great. Actually, the the girl that was sitting next to me, she was from the Marshall Islands, and so it, we were just kind of, you know, bonding as moms. And oh, good. I didn't share with I didn't share with anyone my situation because I didn't. You know, it's not like I don't want to make her trip depressing you know like I don't want to put my emotions on anyone she was kind of having a rough time I was kind of having a rough time we were just kind of helping each other mm-hmm. and uh, you know she's from the island so we were talking about home and it was just it was really what I needed um, mm-hmm. and not to focus on something I had no control over you know so uh, it, it kept my mind off of things and we were just helping each other you know, I don't know if you know how it feels to travel with a baby by yourself, but it's pretty stressful. I do. Especially when, Sabrina's you know, you got a lot of experience in that like, area. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've done it. I've done it quite a few times, but, uh, you know, this time was a little bit different because I was just, high, everything was just so heightened, right? Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I made it. <laughs> Well, Sarah, I made you, it through. You, I got yeah, it to California. Yeah, you use the per- I, you use the perfect word, and you use the word focus. And you know, you are a filmmaker and you are a storyteller. So, could I ask you, as as we let you guys go, because we want to let you guys like rest and recuperate, because you guys have been through so much. If you could maybe frame yourself and your whole family, there you go. I I'd like to get all three of you in the shot because you guys are Aww. together and you guys are okay, and that and that's really what's the most important thing right now. Yo, man, yes, you know, like. Uh... You know, I, I could have won a billion dollars. I could have won fight of the night. I could have won all of this, but that could have easily been taken away at an instant with this, uh, uh, with something that we do every day and that's driving, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so like I, I, I just, so I, I made a video with Cookie. We went and we got ice cream and, <laughs> you know, with, with a $5 ice cream, we were celebrating life, you know what I mean? Like, wow, like... Like, dude, we're, you know, we're talking about this and we're, 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 we're cheersing our ice cream and we're doing all of this and that, but it's like, yo, man, we're like, we're, we could have easily been on a plane back home in a box. Yeah. I wanna... we're, we're, yeah. So, we're so happy you, know? you, you are okay. Yeah. So yeah, please, man, I, you know, and, and, uh, you guys just, man, hug, hug each other, like just a little harder and a little tighter and. You know, uh, call someone that you haven't spoke to in a long time and just tell them you love them. Like, man, for real. Like, uh, this is really, this is a, just perspective. And um, I'm so glad. I'm so I'm so glad to. You know, so th- that's the first time I heard that story. Because I'm I'm just seeing Sarah like for the first time right now. You know, since <laughs> this whole fight camp. Yeah, but I do want to say thank you to everyone that's been reaching out in all the comments and every everything the the wishes. It's. Yeah, you know, it's uh, truly a blessing that mm-hmm. it always happens to Frank. In <laughs> the craziest situations, he always turns out okay <laughs> because God's always watching him, honestly. Okay, and, and be yes. honest, you guys. So, how, many, how many DMs have you guys gotten in the last, like, 40 hours or so? Oh, man, I, I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't checked. I didn't even it's, know DMs go up that high. Good, <laughs> yeah. it, it's, a, it's a good overwhelming right, feeling. Right. Uh yeah. Uh, constant constant messages and lots of love and care and it's it's, it's great so thank you everyone that's watching and 100 percent yeah all the wishes it means a lot to us honestly right. thank mm-hmm. you i really really do believe in the power of prayer so right on guys yeah. thank you amen 
Uh, my man Frank, just uh, fight related, real quick. I don't know if you asked him this, but the last bout you caught the COVID, then this one you caught the car crash. So uh, looking looking ahead, uh, any sign on when the next bout will be? And uh, I mean, just mentally, I know that's got to be frustrating because yeah. in your last, Do, fight, yeah, so, I remember so, you were really so, my to get in there. Yeah, so uh, I have uh, the, the I I spoke to the UFC when I was out there. Or, or when I was in the hospital and I just told them everything, they're like, hey, man, take care of your health. You know, we'll, we'll go see some doctors uh, and, um, you know, heal up first. And then when you're ready, we will reschedule your uh, uh, whatever, you know, we'll, we'll get you back on a card, you know. And, uh, like, I, I mean, on, a, on a funnier on a funnier note, I I messaged Matt Frivola. I was like, hey, man, best of luck this week. You know, uh, best wishes on the weight cut. Uh, Matt Frivola, the guy that I was supposed to fight yeah, this week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, uh, he, so this is the second time that I'm supposed to fight him. He oh. said, uh, he was like, Hey man, uh, man, please get well, heal up and let me, uh, uh you know, hopefully we get to run it back. Cause it's going to be a good fight. I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to fight you anymore, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a sign, right? <laughs> uh, I don't know if I want to fight you no more, dude. Yeah. 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 His name reminds anyway, me of a, yeah, it's, his, his name kind of sounds like it's a cheese, right? Like, hey, that frivola, you ever had a nice grilled cheese with a frivola? The frivola. Yeah. The frivola. <laughs> hey, well, Crank, real quick, we, we have probably, I mean, you, you know, we're inviting you guys to come check out the comments because there's so many that are supportive, that are, you know, thankful. All you oh, no way. I... Best, com- best comment right now, I'm going to say, is from uh, Aaron Redoble. And Aaron writes, Crank, your angel is right next to you. Yeah. Meaning both of them. Oh, get a room. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a room. I got yeah. you. For the Uh-oh. first time. Hey, like, hey, three kids is enough Number for me. Four. Yeah, here we go. You heard it here first on the link. Dry run. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Frank. Thank you. Always a pleasure to catch up with you guys. And hey, good luck. Oh, my guys, neck, man. Chris. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need a massage, babe. Hey, hey. <laughs> All right, have fun, kids. Hey, love you guys. That's Later. Bye, Take care, guys. guys. All right, we're back with more of the link next. Good morning, Guam. Help us celebrate. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. Uno Go, delivering meals from your favorite restaurants and more, including delivering sodas and adult beverages from the Bottle Shack. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Also, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape. Airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11. Live stream through the KUAM News Facebook page or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Marianas Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. 
The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. My whole family is fully vaccinated because we understand the importance of it. I've seen my daughter, her boyfriend, and friends endure COVID, and I've lost family members because of the virus. I chose to get vaccinated to protect those around me, and most importantly, because of my parents. I'm Jonah Gancharfres, KUAM senior producer, and I'm a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination, scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. KUAM Communications continues our perpetuation of our Samoro culture, language, and heritage with features available to our listening and viewing audience, including streaming of Samoro music 24 hours per day on Isla Digital Radio on KUAM.com and the KUAM News app. Samoro News Update, weekdays on the link and the KUAM News YouTube channel. Conversations about life in our Samoro language podcast with Tosta Paku with Kin Conception. Seasonal specials, shows, and other features highlighting the beauty of our language, culture, and history. It's a new era of our continued commitment to our tomorrow heritage. Isla, watch, listen, stream. Viva Isla! Looking for TV schedules, upcoming sports, or special presentations, or what you may have missed over the busy week you had? Well, look no further than KOM Digital Digest. This weekly email newsletter puts all kinds of information in the hands of subscribers each and every week. Just subscribe, and we will make sure you keep up with your favorites and stay informed and entertained throughout it all. Go to KOM.com, click on the newsletter tab, give us your email address, and you are all set. Brought to you in digital partnership with King's Restaurant and Ruby Tuesday Guam. It's the KOM Digital Digest, your weekly guide to the latest information and best entertainment on the stations and platforms of KUAM. The world of television is more exciting than ever. Don't miss a minute of special presentations from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the fun and excitement of award shows and red carpet moments, special series presentations, and other great network programs. Brought to you locally by King's Restaurant, Ruby Tuesday Guam, Bud Light Seltzer, and Docomo Pacific. Giving you more reasons to tune in and turn on. Fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. KUAM News, in partnership with the Guam Visitors Bureau, brings you the Guam Safe and WTTC Safe Travel Certified Program Showcase. Look out for this powerful symbol for visitors, island residents, and industry workers alike, as it represents establishments with a consistent global commitment to safety practices. Stamped with approval by the Guam Visitors Bureau and the World Travel Tourism Council. Every Monday on KUAM News, we'll feature a different local business who's taken the Safe Guam and Safe Travels pledge to maintain health and safety standards to get Guam back on track. Log on to visitguam.com to see how your business can receive the designation, what businesses in our community are Guam Safe certified, and have the WTTC Safe Travel certified. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. Help us celebrate the class of 2021. KUAM wants to help you celebrate this touchstone moment in the lives of your graduates. For the months of May and June, we will flood the social media pages of KUAM with photos and well wishes for the class of 2021 grads. Log on to KUAM.com to submit photos and brief messages or captions. Then look for your special grad on KUAM Instagram and the Facebook pages. From all of your friends here at KUAM, congratulations, seniors! Baby, I'm breathing. 
Oh yeah, Elway Akina. Doing the old Cat Stevens. Well, he was Cat Stevens, and then he was like Joe Islam. Well, his name was Yusef Islam, where Yusef is like Joseph. Hey, Joe Islam! Yeah! One well, of the best parts coming up. Here, that little, that little guitar lick. Here it is. Oh, yep. I don't remember you like a child. 727, good morning. Welcome to the link. Thursday, June 10th. The minority leader, Senator Chris Duanius, uh, joins us now on the show. We bring him on uh, for some updates. Uh, speaker 3, Sterlahi Off Island. Uh, her Wednesday slot. We did offer it to Vice Speaker Tina Munia Barnes, uh, but unfortunately she wasn't able to. Uh, make it in. So, Senator Duenas, good morning. Uh, we'll just start with the budget. I know that this week it was uh, kind of like uh, law enforcement, right? We had uh, GPD, DOC, Guam Fire Department. But a recurring theme that we're seeing in these budget uh, hearings is that you're getting agency heads coming in, submitting a budget plan to the legislature, and then come to find out they're getting X amount of millions of dollars from uh, Governor Lou on the side. Uh, right, and so I'd, I'd caught, like, because it was on, there was a little interaction you had had with the fire chief, uh, Chief Dan Stone, right? Yeah, good morning, Chris and Bree and Jason. Yeah, so good morning. actually with the fire chief, um, he was, uh, he pr pretty much didn't uh, give us any, any uh, indication of what the actual um, request was, but he said there was a request and he wanted uh, to let the governor um, you know, and the fiscal team announced that in, in July. That seems to have become the new, um, you know, statement uh, from all the agencies. Yeah. Um, what's interesting, particularly in public safety, is most of the agencies have been requesting basically a status quo budget. And uh, I think DOC probably uh, of the public safety agencies is the most noteworthy in the fact that um, they're having a real difficult time uh, keeping personnel, uh, lots of resignations, um, you know, lots of people leaving, and uh, their their ability to just bring people on board uh, is 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 really. Uh, I actually asked the, you know, director to go and sit down with the governor and and put more emphasis on this because it really is uh, a uh, possibility if it continues like this to become a, a state of emergency the way that they were, um, you know, expressing. Uh, their manpower issues. Their overtime is is really extreme. Uh, it's I think they're probably going to reach uh, close to three million. They're tracking for this year, and that's just simply because you know guys are pulling 12, 14, 16 hour shifts, um, and and basically they mentioned that uh, sometimes downrange, you know, you basically have one officer for for hundreds of of uh, of inmates, and so. Uh, that was probably the most, um, you know, alarming to me of the agencies. Uh, you know, they talked about the fact that, you know, it, it uh, some of it's, you know, uh, incentive pay uh, that's being worked on. From what I understand, uh, the governor has agreed to the 25% incentive pay, but I guess it's also just, um, it looks like there's probably some morale issues and, and some other issues. So. I think uh, so far, pretty much most agencies have been uh, solid on their requests, but the DOC stood out to me as one we got to really pay attention to. What do you make of that, though, when you get these agency heads in? I mean, it just kind of doesn't seem like it's in good faith where you ask a question of an agency set ahead and you say, hey, how much money did you request from the governor? How much money the governor is going to give you? And you get this response where like, oh, we can't tell you because Adloop's going to get mad. Yeah, I kind of kind of said to the budget <laughs> chair on and off the record, you know, I, I really think uh, we need to press the, the front office harder on this, even if it's draft form. Yeah. You know, uh, it really is um, at this point to me, Chris, really hampering the budget process. I mean, we're if if most agencies come in and they're telling us that on their general fund request, with the exception of a few health agencies that really surprised us. If the, for the most part they're coming in and saying that um, you know they're just requesting whatever ceilings BBMR um, you know requested for them, there's got to be something more behind that because we know that many of these agencies, particularly when it comes to capital outlay, you know have have major needs. I know that GPD needs vehicles, 
I know that, um, you know, GFD has some, you know, major capital outlay issues as well. And when we look back to the American Rescue Plan, I mean, these are some of the things that would kind of make sense. Uh, because when you look at COVID and, and what it did and what it's probably going to do to our budget going forward, there's going to be very little, um, you know, resources when it comes to being able to to buy some of these uh, high ticket items um, that that really just most of the time aren't in, in many of the budgets that are submitted. Most of the time we're sitting around waiting for federal funding and other opportunities to buy, you know, uh, uh, equipment and, and do some of these uh, major things that we're supposed to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of, um, it's, it's really continuing to be very frustrating because I don't think this budget is going to look like this when we get into August. And I've asked the chairman too, to let's not wait until the middle of August to drop, you know, the budget on the table and, and try to get through it in two weeks. I think we should just go in the first week of August and stay in the whole month uh, because we're really going to have a lot to hammer out. I think, I think most budget levels are not going to be what they look like right now in terms of the requests. Senator, you, you, you keep mentioning that, you know, you're pushing the oversight chair, uh, the Senator Joe S. and Augustine. Um, what has been his response? I mean, if you guys were unified with all 15 senators sending over your spending plan to Adeloup, you would think that you would all be unified in demanding Adeloup to give you something. Yeah. Even I, if it I, is in draft form. Yeah, I, I can sense the chairman's uh, frustration. I mean, he really, uh, I, I can see most of the time, if you watch most of the time during the hearings, he's, he's being straightforward uh, on two major issues. One is this. Sometimes we're getting this discussion about, um, you know, uh, uh, issues of longstanding uh, debts that haven't been paid. And uh, he's reminding them, look, you know, that was passed in the last budget, that if you have the resources, pay it. You don't need a, a budget authorization in, in FY22 to do that. Now, we don't know the reason as to why some of those bills aren't being paid when they say that their, their budget is up to date, but definitely on the, uh, on the ARP funding, you know, he keeps asking the agencies, especially the ones that the legislature has already identified to get additional resources. Are you aware that the legislature has requested this for you? And most of the time we're just getting a blank stare. So it's either they're not paying attention or they're just being told to not participate. And uh, I can hear his growing frustration and, um, you know, maybe it's time to, to sit down with him and pen a letter to the governor so we can put it on the record saying, look, you know, we, we're trying to get through this budget process, but you're really not helping us along. What about the, the sense from your colleagues? Yeah, you hear the same amount of frustration. I think that, um, you know, for the most part, we're trying to be uh, conservative. You know, I, I do got to appreciate when agencies come in uh, and request, you know, the, uh, to stay within their ceiling and with a relatively status quo budget. Particularly when you look at some of these agencies, Bree, where they have, uh, you know, there's one of the, the things we're hearing a lot from agencies too is there's a lot of pending retirements. And when you look at an individual who retires, especially a 30 plus year career, their salary is equivalent to probably two, two and a half employees. So on one hand, you're losing institutional knowledge. On the other hand, you're really freeing up to get additional manpower because, you know, the, there's such a large disparity in the starting pay and what an individual retires at. So, you know, I, I got to respect, um, you know, that that fact. And most of us know that, you know, after PUA and that fuck is done, I don't know what 2023 is going to look like. And so I do respect the fact that they're coming in with regard uh, to that. Um, but but we also are, like I said, continue to be frustrated that um, that they're not, you know, putting it on the line in terms of, uh, of, of what this ARP funding is going to do for them. and. It's just really tough for us to to have a complete picture of what things are going to look like. The chairman did say this, you know, from the beginning. He said, "Look, this ARP funding and the request that we've given to be able to help the agencies is mostly in capital outlay and things that they weren't aren't going to be able to fund for because budgets are probably going to be lean going forward. This is designed to smooth out the budgets over at least the next two fiscal years." So I think that's where he's kind of um, continued to, you know, uh, tell the agencies, you know, look, we need this information because uh, this is where you're going to get the final budget that's requested, um, you know, whether the governor signs it or vetoes it or whatever that process becomes. 
it's going to come out of this house. So, you know, be straight up when you come down here. All right. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I don't know how you guys aren't flipping the table down there at the session. I mean, you're getting played for fools. You really are. It's frustrating. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I got these directors. That's that's one of the most frustrating spots to be in because, you know, on one hand, you've got the front office that tells them, you know, uh, um, you know, just go down there and, and, and tell them what we've told you to tell them. And then, <laughs> you know, yesterday, I will tell you, say this, I, I give it up to Tim Muggan yesterday. Um, you know, veterans came in and I really wasn't aware that they had such a minuscule budget, you know, for many, many years now. And their budget as proposed originally without what the amendments that they, they made was really just for, you know, warm bodies that they had and, and, and not even really the vacancies. And so he adjusted the level up by 300,000 from their regular budget. And then he gave us two worksheets on supplemental budget for equipment and capital outlay for things that they need particularly at the veteran cemetery. So we are seeing sometimes, you know, that uh, some of the agencies are coming down and saying, you know, well, I'm just going to put it out there, you know, what I need and what I'm requesting. And so, you know, we asked him to say, to circle back to the front office and, and formalize it and make sure that it's just not a request that's put down to us that, 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 you know, you really should send us a completely revised budget. That became kind of a theme yesterday too, because actually parks and rec, came on board later and gave us a new folder revised as of June 2. And it looks like they're looking for more park rangers and some other adjustments to their budget. So, you know, uh, there there is some, a little bit of a shift with some of the agencies, but but yeah, I think it's time, you know, I, and I'll talk to him again today. I think it's time for the chairman to kind of, you know, almost demand really that, that we see the draft because, or, or just suspend, you know, the, oh, <laughs> the wow. Yeah. The talks and say yeah. in, in August the whole way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Tim, Tim was on the link when he said he was going to be uh, shooting for the stars and hopefully, what did he say, Chris? Uh, uh, aim for the stars. Just get the clouds. Yeah. Yeah. Get the clouds. <laughs> yeah. I, I know that. And, and that's another, you know, area where we basically said, you know, look, you know, we've identified funding for you in, in the ARP. And, uh, and what we were trying to tell him, and he did agree, you know, they, they are being aggressive on, on you know, um, uh, applying for federal grants. And we were like, well, here's a perfect time to make sure you get your ARP money so that while you're applying for those grants, you know, when they, when they come about, because most of those grants are multi-year grants, that will backfill your needs going forward after you've been able to, to really buy the equipment and things that you need at the cemetery and also one of the biggest things is they, and we identified this, they do need IT upgrades. I mean, they basically say straight up they're in the stone age and they're communicating with documents back and forth to, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, health facilities in Hawaii and, you know, trying to facilitate applications and working on behalf of veterans for critical things that these veterans need when they get to their destination. They requested 12 additional laptops, a server, some other, things that really will kind of, and, and, and working with OTEC, OTEC said, you get the equipment, we'll come in and, and bring you in, you know, into the 21st century. So, um, you know, that that's something that we, uh, I do appreciate the fact that they've stepped up and said, we need this. Now, you get a federal grant, you know, in another year or two, and that helps you maintain that effort going down the road. So, you know, this is where we really want to make sure that that when sometimes there's discussion on should we give more public assistance with this money and the like and i'm certain there's some kind of an area you know for that all rise but we haven't gotten that yet but but the thing is is that we've got to also really do these critical things you know breed that help the people these are veterans for heaven's sake right i mean we mm -hmm. should have up-to-date information whereby we can facilitate uh, you know, whatever they need, particularly if they're leaving off island, that all their documents are transmitted properly through the application process on a, on a proper computer, as opposed to, you know, just trying to wing it. So, um, you know, th this is where the legislature, I think, really has seen that there are critical needs that are direct services to our people. 
uh, you know, especially our veterans. I mean, we should be ashamed of ourselves if we can't, you know, do that basic, uh, you know, operation to help them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, day. thanks, uh, Senator. Yeah. <laughs> Rant over. It's like, I feel like, I feel like we're uh, always talking about where's the spending plan, where's the spending yeah. plan, what's the latest update from the legislature, and there's just no update. So yeah, I guess and, it's time know, for you guys to kick it up a notch. Maybe. I thought our resolution, you know, I mean, while it wasn't, you know, uh, um, you know, um, 30, 40, 50, 100 people, there was some substantive things there. I, I think one of the gentlemen that testified, we should really take a close look at this, you know, he said, um, you know, maybe put 100 million away and or, or right now inject it into immediately getting tax refunds out. Uh, that's probably what the balance is. And now you're ahead of the game. And, uh, you know, you can you can really, you know, I remember under the Cabo administration, we were trying to do that through a, a line of credit uh, kind of set up, but that was an interesting idea and something we should actually look at. Like I said, I think right now that 300 million for the hospitals, basically a savings account. I, I haven't seen the governor's office move to to really be, uh, you know, to show us that, that, that they've really earmarked that for that potential. But uh, I thought that was an interesting idea just from a private sector guy coming forward and saying, you know, and especially one of the main reasons why this gentleman testified in that, you know, with regard to that is because a lot of people who filed their income in 2020 and they're basing it on 2020 are actually going to be getting a return next year as opposed to, you know, they're not going to cut a new stimulus check, right? And so on some of these, it's actually going to be an enhanced tax return. So to get ahead of the game and get that money out in the community, that helps people as well. So I thought that was a really interesting idea. All right. Anything else, Senator? Yeah. Uh, we just keep plugging away. <laughs> I, I think that um, I think one of the more interesting hearings yeah. that's going to come up, and I'm glad that the prime sponsors uh, have called uh, for this hearing. Uh, as a co-sponsor, I, I let them know that hey, look, you got to get this issue um you know uh discussed it's it's going to be a heavyweight issue for this legislature and that's the medical malpractice um, um legislation uh with regard to arbitration and uh i know that there's been a lot of uh, you know uh, vocal doctors lately coming out uh, discussing you know uh, why this legislation is is dangerous and so i know on the 23rd there will be a hearing and in july there will be two additional hearings which I requested that the authors do in order to be able to have a proper discussion on this issue. So I think something, you know, Chris, Bree, Jason, I think this is going to be uh, other than ARP and other than, um, you know, the budget of the government and other than fixing our economy and trying to get tourism back on track and all those things. Uh, I think this is going to be the bill that's going to be, this legislature is going to have to really grapple with. On one hand, you have these heart wrenching stories of individuals who've either lost family members or, or individuals who might have uh, been uh, otherwise uh, incapacitated or, or maimed, if you will, right. uh, in, a, in a procedure that there's a perception that, you know, something uh, uh, that there was negligence. On the other hand, you have a situation whereby our island needs, you know, uh, physicians with specialties that are willing to operate in an environment uh, that's not litigious. And so this, this guys, I think is gonna be uh, the, the, the premier uh, test of, of how we uh, try to balance that issue. Yeah, yeah, I mean, as it stands now, Senator, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you, like, let's say, knocking on wood, you know, had a, a malpractice or a wrongful death, the process is I go before a three-person panel, but I need $40,000 to do that, right? Yeah. I. What the when I when I was when I received the presentation from the prime sponsors, you know, I was like, wow, there's been a lot of research that's been put into this. Yeah. But what I walked away with more than anything else is this idea of the magistrate's judge to be able to sort of referee and and kind of make the process uh, not so cost prohibitive. Like I said, this is a tough situation. Yeah. But really what it comes down to is even in some of these cases where people are upset, right? And, and we even he'd heard some doctors lately say, hey, are there bad apples? There's bad apples everywhere, right? Uh, let's weed out the bad apples. But one of, one of the things that, that was really, uh, I was really struck by is, you know, even attorneys who have 
you know, deep pockets in terms of their ability to do pro bono work, basically don't take any of these cases because it's so detailed and it's so arduous uh, to go through the process. And so I don't know what the middle is yet, Chris and Bree, but this is going to be a tough one. And, and Chris, you're right. I mean, basically it comes down to whether it's the ability uh, for some sort of substantial award or whether it's just the fact that before you even get to discuss the issue, yeah. you got to have a couple hundred grand down on the table. Uh, it's crazy. It's that's crazy. Like a yeah. system that is really, yeah. really diff. You know, it's that that's a difficult system to navigate. I mean, let me oversimplify it for you. Uh, Guam, when compared to other jurisdictions, I don't um, believe that uh, patients have the rights that they need to. I mean, it's just so obvious. Right. Um, but you're right, it's going to be hot because we've already got some doctors who are coming out saying, I'm not going to do these kind of patients anymore because I don't like this bill. So it's going to be contentious when you've already got these doctors who are like setting, you know, the line, if you will. Senator, we got to go. But thank you so much for okay. your time. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Keep an eye on that one, guys, as I know you will. And right on. Hey, Bri, I'm not sure whether you're on vacation or what you're doing, but have fun out there. All right, thanks. Thank you. Glad so to much. see you, everybody. All right. <laughs> Stay safe. Uh, let's keep okay. it in the K-Wave News Zoom room. We'll go over to uh, Ms. Maria Pangolina of the Guam Election Commission. Good morning, Ms. Maria. Unmute, unmute. Good morning. Bananas are good. Good morning. <laughs> Half a day. So, Miss Maria, we wanted to bring you out just to just to play a little catch up, uh, real quick, because I know that you said that you guys were working on the uh, twenty uh, twenty comparative uh, election analysis report, and that you were going to submit it to the board, right? Yeah, we actually submitted a draft um, in the meeting last month, so they are currently reviewing it. We are currently editing it. Uh, we continue to work on it to make. sure that it's um, accurate and a comprehensive report. Um, and what about the financial disclosure statements? This was an issue that we'd also followed uh, with you, and there's been a development, right? Okay, so for the first time, uh, the financial disclosure statements were forwarded to the Guam Ethics Commission. So the law requires that the Guam Election Commission uh, forward the... Uh, FDS reports to them. So this was this was the first time we've done it. Uh, as we continue to receive them, we continue to submit them to the Guam Ethics Commission. How many did you submit? Um, you know, I don't have a count. And as you can tell, I'm not in the office yet. I'm here in the parking lot. But um, most, almost everyone had, uh, everyone complied with the deadline and then um, people are slowly submitting it. Uh, for those that requested um, extensions, they have up until October 19th to submit their um, FDS, their financial disclosure statements. So what, does the Guam Ethics Commission have like a forensic auditor that they can go through this stuff? And... <laughs> um, uh, that wasn't I, even you know, a joke. <laughs> I, I was, I, you know, we continue to dialogue, um, Executive Director Jesse Kenga. In fact, we spoke with him yesterday um, as they continue to receive it. So, uh, you know, we're, we're putting the standard operating procedure in place to make sure that we comply with the law. So that's an evolving process. Uh, we've, you know, as soon as we found, as soon as um, uh, we found that this out, and, and and to to make sure that we are complying, uh, we are watching out. Um, I believe the law was passed to make the Guam Ethics Commission independent and autonomous as well. So we're going to review that. I don't know if the governor has signed it yet. And uh, we will make sure that um, the Guam Election Commission's um, uh, processes that are affected by maybe even the new law um, uh, will that we, we want to make sure that we meet all the requirements. 
What about posturing for the uh, 2022 elections? Has that already begun, Ms. Maria? <laughs> Actually, um, we start that July 1st, but um, Chris and Bree, uh, we've gone through an invitation for bid uh, for our office space. So that we, um, we issued a notice of intent to award. And uh, that's going to keep us busy, I think, because if the process goes through, we won't be at the GCIC building come October 1st. So where will you be? Okay, uh, the Oka building in Tamuning, uh, they came, the Oka building uh, bid came in uh, uh, the lowest bidder and responsive as well. So they met all our, me our needs on paper. Uh, we are waiting for the buildup so that they can uh, we can see if they will build it up to the specs that we requested. Uh, they have up until October 1st to do that. Okay. Well, Oka Building, which um, one? Sorry, sorry. Plenty Buildings in Oka. Um, the, o um, the Oka Building is right next to Mega Drugs. Um, if you're coming, if you're heading to St. Anthony, um, it's the Payless and then Mega Drugs and then the Oka building. Uh, it houses the Oka Pharmacy. Is it like a circular kind of building? Yes. Okay. Uh, toward, in the front, that's what it looks like. Okay. okay. Mm. Yeah. What was the, why, why'd right. you guys, sorry, why'd you guys move out of GCIC? Was it just something like it wasn't, didn't, wasn't able to accommodate what you guys need for the next election or? No, no, no. Uh, we went through the, we went through the procurement process. Mm -hmm. And um, Oka Building came in the lowest bidder and responsive as well, which means, um, you know, yes, GCIC bid as well, uh, but um, but because the uh, we had to follow the the you know the procurement rules and say okay, so let's see who met all our requirements, and based on that, uh, we look at the. People that met all our requirements went out and got some more information. And then we, uh, through the process of uh, the evaluation, we found out that uh, the Oka building was mo was responsive and the lowest bidder. Okay. Sorry, Bree, go ahead. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on something. Is the Guam Election Commission uh, or the board recommending to continue early voting for the next election and onward? Um, uh, you know, we've left that up to the legislature. Um, right now, the law stands that if we do it 30 days before the election, but only for those with excuse. So I've heard, and there there is um, uh, there is a um, uh, a bill that has been introduced for early voting. So we're going to watch that closely as well. Mm -hmm. um, Maria, for uh, candidates or potential candidates that have had fundraisers, have they all been filing their reports? Um, have you know, I think we only have one organizational report for okay. 2022. I think mm -hmm. we only have one that I can think offhand. Um, and so... Uh, that's all we know. Um, uh, current election, of, uh, current elected officials and others who had a deficit or had a surplus from 2020, they continue to file supplemental reports. Mm -hmm. Those supplemental reports will turn into organizational reports once they start campaigning for 2022. Mm -hmm. Right, and so how soon after, if I hold a fundraiser today, how soon after is there a time that I need to file uh, my uh, financial reports with the G? Um, so if it, if you've received contributions or had a fundraiser or spent money, uh, spent $250 or more, you have to report within 10 working days. All right, so um, that organizational report that was filed, who filed it? That's for the re-election of Lou and Josh. 
Okay, so they held a fundraiser uh, on the day that the bars open. Um, did they file their report within those 10 days? Actually, the report was filed um, earlier than that. Nice. Um, and yeah, it was filed, I believe, in 2019. So there must be... None, there... 2009, how could they file a report in 2019 when the fundraiser was in 2020? One right, correct? Yeah, I, I think you filed the, open. but you filed the org report, and then uh, that's when you, if you spend two hundred fifty or more, you file that organization report. So they did that in twenty nineteen. So that means that they don't have to file anything on the fundraiser they had uh, when the bars opened until what, Miss Maria, ten days before the primary. That's correct. Yeah. Well, well, practically an expert. Ten days after the fundraiser. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah, no. that was ten days after the fundraiser. No, but they that she said if they spend two hundred fifty or more, they have to file ten days after that. But they already did that in twenty nineteen. So they had some yes. other event in twenty nineteen where they spent two hundred fifty bucks. Mm -hmm. So then they filed that org report. And but you know there should be a law though, uh, Miss Maria, where the frequency of filing is increased mm -hmm. because what ends up happening is you guys get these reports dumped on your head 10 days before the primary while you're preparing for the primary <laughs> and you can't ever look them over. I've been, and I've done these yes. stories on the campaign finance. It's nuts. That's, yeah. So, so Chris and Bree, that's one of our, our, of our priority recommendations right. to change the filing dates for campaign finance. So our recommendation is that we follow the federal election commission of once you file an organizational report, then you'd be uh, required to fi file a quarterly campaign finance yeah. report. Yep. And yeah. so, if yeah, and and that's what we you know, and and so that will that will get us the Guam Election Commission some time to review it and get back to the to the candidate to say okay. Please make sure next time you do this correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's one area that definitely uh, our <laughs> island could use a lot of improvement is campaign finance. It's just wild, the wild, wild west in a lot of ways. Yeah. Chris and Bree, so, um, so part of the election comparative analysis report, as required by law, should, well, what's also required by law is that we submit recommendations so uh, to update and upgrade the law. So that's one of them. That's one of the recommendations we have. Um, we with the early voting law, we've left it alone because there's already a bill that's passed. But a second recommendation that we have that we hope they take up is that for the nonpartisan candidates. If you remember nonpartisan candidates for the attorney general and the public auditor, they're always on the primary election, okay? That generates a lot more expenses. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and I don't, you know, we're, 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 we just want to present to the legislature that what happens when we, um, when that, um, mandate is removed that they just run in the general if there's only two candidates already. So the current law says that if there are uh, two candidates, the two highest vote getters in the primary election goes on to the general election. What we want to do, what the Guam Election Commission wants to do is if there's only two candidates, then let them just go straight to the general instead of generating a second ballot sheet. So, so that's another recommendation. We have a few, right. but just to highlight the probably the the most immediate as far as the preparation for the election cycle goes. Uh, those are the the two that that stick out in my mind well, thank, uh, as we continue to look at it. Thank you, Miss Maria. It's been a very productive uh, fifteen minutes with you. Definitely appreciate your time. Uh, may I put one more in? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So you know that we lost 8,961 voters from the purging of voters uh, back in February, January, I'm sorry. So we've done our, what, what, what's also keeping us busy that every third Wednesday of the month, 
we have volunteer vote registrar training. So we do have, we've trained some uh, vo voter registrars that were, um, that were deputized in 2020 and 2018. Those volunteer voter registrars can come into our office and pick up their packet. But we've also uh, sent out uh, voter registrars to some of the mayor's offices. So we've been encouraging the mayors to send them, uh, send their their employees to come in and pick up their packets. So we can, you know, so we can start the uh, registration process. There you go. Thank you, Ms. Maria. Thank you. Thank All right. You. It's 801. Okay, Good morning. Good morning, Guam. All right. Good morning, Jason. Good morning. Good morning, Sabrina. Hi. Hi. Hey, KUM TV. Good morning. Fix yourself. We're on TV, Jay. We made it big. This is it. A lot of information. A lot of... Emotional, wow. emotional interview with uh, Frank Camacho and right. Sarah Phyllis yep. Camacho yep. earlier, and then uh, should we say bombshell for saying the GEC's real? And as long as I've been with KUAM, the GEC's yes. always been downtown at the GCIC building. Right, they have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, she didn't really answer my question. I said, "Well, why'd you guys move?" And she said, "Oh, because we put it in procurement." But I don't know. Was there a reason? Maybe their lease was up. But oh, you maybe know, that was it. Maybe their lease was. But up you anyway. asked the best question when you said when they said we're moving to you know like the, the Oka building. When yeah. you said is it that circular one with the one with the big rotunda? Yeah. There's a lot of space in there. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, we've already had an eventful show, guys. Uh, you can get it on Facebook Live, uh, 6 a.m. ish. <laughs> we're also on the breeze. KUAM TV. What's up, my friends? Uh, Senator Chris Duane, Duaneus, minority leader, uh, continue to express frustration at the budget process uh, where you have um, these agencies submitting a budget uh, calling for X amount of dollars, millions of dollars, and then you also find out that they hit up uh, the governor um, for uh, ARP funding. And that's just kind of thrown a whole monkey wrench into the entire budget uh, process. And uh, you know, minority leader Senator Duaneus, uh, was it you or him who said maybe we just need to pause the whole budget process until they figure it out? He said it. Right, yeah, okay. So, I mean, it does seem a little disingenuous, but, you know, the, what the people want is they want cooperation. They want everyone to work together, and sadly, that's uh, mm -hmm. it's not happening. Uh, and the people also want their money. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, Mark Scott, John Canata, the uh, Guam International Airport Executive Manager, uh, Mayor Paul McDonald, Mayor Louise Rivera coming up on the show. Plus, of course, we got Cover Me at 8.04. Let's go ahead and get into the news with the very latest right here on the link, which is brought to you by Pacific Points, IT&E, Cowboy Enterprises, and our friends at Jack in the Box. It's another one, the link, Thursday, June 10th, with the very latest from the KUAM News team. Sabrina Salas Mantanani. Good morning, Sabrina. Off day, everybody. Trial is scheduled to get underway in the Superior Court for George Chamber Jr. He is accused of committing pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA fraud for allegedly submitting falsified records to receive PUA benefits during the COVID pandemic. The driver of a car that fatally struck a four-year-old boy back in 2019 will see no jail time. Marlene Evely entered a plea agreement and admitted to the crime. She was indicted for vehicular homicide as a second-degree felony. According to KUAM News Files, four-year-old Jericho Zion David was playing outside his home in Dededo when he fell on the road. According to the plea agreement, she faces a suspended five-year prison sentence with credit for time served. She was placed on a three-year supervised probation term. And with more news, here's Tyler Mantanani. When it's in half a day, everyone, I'm Tyler Matinani with your headlines here on The Link. 
No longer a missing person, 27-year-old Michael Castro's case has been classified to a homicide investigation. As 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore was picked up in the state of Florida and is being extradited back to Guam to answer to not only murder charges for the death of Castro, but also attempted murder for a separate case. For the past eight months, authorities provided no comments and no updates on the status of missing 27-year-old Michael Castro until Wednesday morning after the U.S. Marshal Service arrested 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore in Florida. Subsequently, the Office of the Attorney General and the Guam Police Department held an emergency joint press conference confirming Moore suspected of murdering Castro and accused of attempted murder in a separate case. Chief of Police Stephen Ignacio. An extensive investigation into Michael Castro's disappearance was launched by GPD's Criminal Investigation Division. Through the course of our investigation, our detectives identified 23-year-old Nicholas Wayne Moore as a person of interest in reference to the ongoing missing person investigation. According to Ignacio, as the case developed, GPD obtained both the local and federal warrant. Moore was nabbed by the U.S. Marshal Service Florida Caribbean Regional Fugitive Task Force and assisted by Bay County Sheriffs. At this time, Mr. Nicholas Moore is being held, and uh, it is our understanding that uh, he will be extradited back to Guam to answer to these charges. According to Chief Prosecutor Basil O'Malley, Moore will appear first in the District Court of Guam to answer to a federal warrant and then be prosecuted locally. It seems he will also be facing federal charges, explains AG Levin Camacho. A separate charge is fleeing a jurisdiction to avoid prosecution. So there is actually, that is a federal offense, and the U.S. Attorney's Office does have jurisdiction over that matter, and, and ultimately the, the U.S. Attorney's Office will decide how it wishes to proceed, but they're well aware that our office intends on prosecuting the, the murder and attempted murder charges here. Law enforcement was unable to comment on whether or not Castro's body has been located due to ongoing investigations. GPD was also limited on providing details regarding the second criminal case Moore is being held on. We also believe uh, that uh, Nicholas Moore was involved in another uh, incident which involved uh, the attempted murder of an individual uh, in the central area. Uh, again, because uh, there's a connection between Nicholas Moore and two cases, uh, we, we don't want to comment uh, beyond that. KUAM pressed for answers, but Chief Ignacio and AG Camacho didn't let up. Right now we're just trying to lay out this procedurally what's going on, but it, it, this is very much a, a live investigation and it is developing, I would say, almost daily uh, in terms of where we're going from here, but this is a very big first and significant first step. Castro's mother, Melanie Guerrero, who has fought endlessly for justice and continued to keep an open dialogue with KUAM, confirms that Castro and Moore knew each other. This case is ongoing. 25-year-old Melvin Sablon Leon Guerrero Jr. was arrested after allegedly sexually assaulting two young teens. According to a magistrate's complaint on April 22nd, a witness reported the incidents to police. Officers interviewed a 13-year-old victim who alleged that on March 22nd, she woke up to Leon Guerrero on top of her. He allegedly told her, quote, just let me do it. The victim was able to fight Leon Guerrero off after 10 minutes and he asked her not to tell anyone. Officers also interviewed a 14-year-old victim who alleged Leon Guerrero had been sexually assaulting her since she was 12 years old. She said that on three occasions between December 2020 through March of this year, she woke to Leon Guerrero pinning her down, sexually assaulting her. Leon Guerrero is facing three counts, each of first, second and third degree criminal sexual conduct and attempted first degree criminal sexual conduct. The Department of Youth Affairs was among the agencies to go under the microscope, microscope Wednesday as the budget hearings continued. While DYA Director Melanie Brennan discussed her fiscal year 2022 spending plan, senators also wanted an update on a different agency she's also in charge of, Child Protective Services. The governor ordered the takeover of CPS by DYA back in January. She cited a crisis situation because of a huge backlog in cases. About half a dozen of DYA employees, including Brennan, are still at CPS. We continue to be there. We are trying to, as soon as a new warm body comes in for CPS, we're trying to switch off. And so we do anticipate three warm bodies coming in um, in June. But it has been difficult to recruit um, social workers for CPS. It's not an easy job. And sometimes we go through the whole recruitment process, we make a selection, and 
they turn around and tell us, no, thank you. I found something else. Brennan admits it has been a struggle. She cannot say specifically when they would be relinquishing control over DYA. It could be August or even December. But she says she expects there will be a continuous relationship between DYA and CPS going forward. With regional headlines, here's KSPN2 News. Hoffaday's and Tito Guam. Here's what's making headlines in the CNMA. A fire occurred early this morning at the Northern Mariana Seafaring Traditions Program Ut in Susupi, burning half of the roof and a canoe. John Costro says that many found out about the fire through a video that went viral on social media. But he says that when he arrived at the canoe house early this morning, he saw half the roof gone and just knew that something was wrong. As soon as I parked the car, I, I just stared and I, I was thinking, I was hoping, I'm dreaming. But unfortunately, that's the sad truth. It did happen. Kostro and his team has been working on this canoe for about two years now, and it was so close to a finish until this tragic incident happened. This week, we would complete the main hole. If you can look behind you, there's that one last plank that's going on this side of the canoe. And then we'll be done for the week uh, on the hole for this week. Then we jump over to putting the arms for the outrigger. And then unfortunately this thing happened, so we're back to, wow, I don't know, calculations, I don't know, in my head right now. His suspicion on how the fire started is this. The fire started on the south side, which is the leeward side, where the wind's not blowing at all. I, I believe somebody was here uh, resting and probably mosquitoes were getting to him or her and decided to smoke the mosquito out and end up fire running away because the only that's the only uh, assumption I can make because if this was done intentionally why not just start the fire in the middle of the canoe or start it from the windward side and let the whole place go. Canoe voyagers who worked on this project are deeply saddened, but Kostru says they are grateful for the words of encouragement from community members that has helped them to move forward. I'm trying to grasp the, you know, that, that, that saying that things happen for a reason, so I'm trying to uh, accept what's the good side of this. So far, maybe it's too early to say, yeah, what's the good side, but... Uh, encouragements and uh, folks that are sincere about the project come by and uh, share their sentiments about the program and our bosses are uh, announced that we will continue so at least that side we're seeing the light on the end of the tunnel for more news please visit siphontv.com for kspn2 i'm sally Lemus. That's it for now. We'll see you tonight for KUAM News Primetime. As for the latest numbers, the Joint Information Center reports there were nine new confirmed cases of COVID-19 out of 673 tests performed on Tuesday. Seven of those cases were identified through contact tracing. To date, there have been a total of 8,200 24 officially reported cases of COVID, 139 deaths, 55 cases are active, and there have been 8,030 recoveries. A total of five people are hospitalized. Guam's CAR score is 0 0.5. A total of 85,023 residents have been fully vaccinated. The Guam National Guard, in the meantime, is ready to mobilize on-site vaccination clinics. This is similar to the outreach held at the port last week. The Guard can administer COVID vaccines at work sites or for large groups of at least 50 people or more. For more information, you're urged to call 682-2172. With Governor Lulian Guerrero's announcement last week about the Vax to Win incentive program, we stopped by Operation Liberate Guam to see what pushes island residents to get immunized against the virus. After dealing with a challenging school year and not having social interactions with friends and family members, 13-year-old Chloe Matro and 17-year-old Sophia Matro of Zonia made their way to the UOG Fieldhouse to get their first dose of the Pfizer vaccine. 
They share that getting vaccinated will be the way to some form of normalcy. I miss going out with my friends so I can, because <laughs> uh, my parents want me to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I don't get sick. Aside from not being able to talk to friends, just having to stay at home a lot really just affected how I perceived how I wanted to treat my health because I didn't really like going out, but at the same time, I felt that I needed to exercise more. So yeah, I really had to challenge. 13-year-olds Marky Mapo of Dededo and Momong resident Gabriel Muenu shared why residents should get vaccinated. Please take the vaccine to be protected from the COVID-19. It's safe to best to get a vaccination so you could be safe from COVID. Operation Liberate Guam resumed administering COVID-19 vaccines to the community at the UOG Fieldhouse in efforts to get the island to reach herd immunity or 80% of eligible individuals vaccinated against the virus. Joint Task Force 671 Public Affairs Specialist Janine Guzman said that there has been a slight increase of residents getting vaccinated. She said it's hard to tell whether the increase is because of the incentive program. However, there are a lot of people receiving their first dose of the vaccine. According to a spreadsheet, last Tuesday, 748 vaccines were administered. Then yesterday, 791 individuals got vaccinated. That is 43 more people who opted to get their shots. Appointment bookings are still available here at the EOG Cavill Fieldhouse from 12 to 5.30 p.m. You can register online at tinyurl.com backslash vaxguam. Reporting for Guam's News Network, Guam Husi Isaiah Uggen. President Biden is setting off on a more than week-long trip to Europe where he'll meet with more than 35 world leaders, ranging from the Queen of England to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Skylar Henry has more details. President Biden swatted away a cicada as he prepared to board Air Force One, and then he laid out his agenda for his European trip. Strengthening the alliance, make it clear to Putin and to uh, China that Europe and the United States are tight, and the G7 is going to move. It's a jam-packed trip, starting with a meeting with British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and then the G7 summit in Cornwall, England. He will also meet with Queen Elizabeth before heading to Belgium for a meeting of NATO partners to discuss defense spending, cybersecurity, and Russia. He's been getting ready for 50 years. Um, he has been on the world stage. He's known a number of these leaders for decades, uh, including President Putin and including a number of the leaders he'll see at NATO and he'll see at the G7. The headline stop of the trip will likely be the president's face-to-face -face meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin, as both countries continue to be on opposite sides of most issues. Joe Biden is not meeting with Vladimir Putin despite our country's differences. He's meeting with him because of our country's differences. There is simply a lot we have to work through. The White House says the president plans to discuss a number of topics, including Russian aggression in Ukraine, election interference, and Russia's possible harboring of cyber criminals. The president downplayed expectations for the Putin meeting this morning. The relationship has been strained ever since their first meeting in 2011, when Vice President Biden told Putin he doesn't have a soul. Skyler Henry, CBS News, the White House. A long-awaited massive invasion of cicadas is now swarming large areas of the east and midwest, and these little bugs can be deafening. This group of insects called Brood 10 emerges from the ground every 17 years. They won't stick around much longer. Ben Tracy shows what the bugs are doing how and how the rest of us are coping. In the backyard of Jessica Helms' Maryland home, we were getting over 2,000 a day. It is peak cicada season. Bye. Her six-year-old Olivia started counting them. We found many bugs. But quickly ran out of fingers and then buckets. More and, and then we had to watch where we're stepping. Olivia is now invested in these insects, giving the cicadas names and rides on all of her toys. We are surrounded by cicadas. We are surrounded by not just the cicadas, but their sound from every direction. Sammy Ramsey is an entomologist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. He's also known as Dr. Bugs. Cicada season has been so exciting. Pretty much all the cicadas that exist are out of the ground and they are in the treetops. This is the symphony section of the experience. For the next four weeks, the cicadas will fulfill their 17-year mission, mating in the trees to produce the next generation while trying to avoid getting eaten by a bird before they do it. Truly a majestic existence. 
Are you sure you're a scientist yeah. at the USDA? <laughs> Dr. Bugs isn't the only one enjoying cicada mania. These odd-looking insects are inspiring art, fashion, and music. A brewery in Virginia created a cicada beer and named it Brood X. No cicadas were harmed in the making of this beer. <laughs> which is perfect for washing down a crunchy cicada taco. So good. You'd expect the guy wearing this to enjoy eating that. But at this restaurant in Leesburg, Virginia, they're selling 30 orders of cicada tacos every day. About 50% of those that come in order a second round of tacos. Tobias Padovano is the chef. Those look tasty. I do see little cicada eyes looking at me. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're going to look at you. They'll, they'll judge you. Unfortunately, after waiting 17 years, the cicada's moment of glory is fleeting. They are here for a good time, not a long time. Dr. Bug says both the males and the females will die off after mating. The eggs the females lay in the trees will fall to the ground and the 17-year cycle starts all over. Are you going to be sad to see them go? Ben, I cannot describe to you the, just the sense of dread that is already in my heart, knowing that I am not going to be able to experience this again until I am in my 40s. That's perspective. And so we soon say farewell to Brood 10. We'll see you in 2038. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Washington. With your news in tomorrow, here's King Conception. Bueno, ito na pala ito get some tubig kuno tomo rin ni KUAM News. Pernisenta ni Familian Mito gi First Hawaiian Bank. Bandan niya ay opisina ni Hinderada Bagadong Guahan sa Departamento ng Polisya. Ginigam na ogan para may sima mas informasyon para di maaresta si Nicholas Wayne Moore gi sa Florida. I U.S. Marshal Service Task Force Guihi man matoto sa ni Bay County Sheriff's Office para makoni si Moore. No toto Guahan gi Panama City Beach. I have any GPD. Si Steve Ignacio a confit man na magata than marista si Moore sa polifinay tay Michael Castro. Pentisyati on his night dot. No ma report na malingo disti November gi mapos na sakan. Malilika uproto na kausan pinino loki. Zeling a Ignacio na sangya esti na kausa. Pero ma extra dot si Moore tati Guahan. Sigon ni Chief Prosecutor si Basil O'Malley, sempre anuk finit na si Morgie District Court of Guam para opia di as kapazi e war in federal, pero sa dunong mga prosecute ni inirada bagarong guahan sa polisi si Gamay investiga STC hana kausa. Tigam bigyan ng information mas alang nusi GPD sa ni ofisina ni AG para kausa jan tamano na grado nung matungo si more than si Castro. Gimas Di mapreso si Marlene Evely po da susugo ni kareta no pinino ang 4 anos na pagkanlahi di 2019. Kumuntata si Evely para plea agreement sa admite na umisawi. No rin ni por KUAM mandate si Evely por vehicular homicide no segundo grado na felony. Segundo ni zonia plea agreement na fafana 5 anos gi preso da masuspendi adzo. Zan na kredito po di sinagana gi tribunal esta. Mapolo loko yi gi supervised probation para tres anos da kuma kanta di si kondisyon ni adzo na probation si na makoni para preso yung sigidas. Mas gin ni Kotti. Mayresta si Melvin Sablan Leon Groru Jr. Dispues ane ma atsake na manatakan bas ni dos na hubensita. I magistrates na complain na explica na gi dia 22 gi abriad ma kiyate si Leon Groru gi i GPD na gin siya i lumii i bidan niya. Ma interview ni i polisia uno na tres anos na biktima na sangan na gi matso 22 mat mata gi da staba si Leon Groru gi hilo niya. Sinangan dis Leon Groru paro sedi ha i minalago niya. Hamumuzi ipad kong si Leon Guerrero da sumuha logi des minutos na tempo finaisang gi para mungo mesang gani po di ibadaan niya. May interview loko yung 14 anos na padgon na sangan na destiyan ay 12 anos gwe na edad at tutuhon si Leon Guerrero is sexual assault kontra guiza. Ilingyan na tres gaya des ti Desembre gi 2020 na sakan esta i matso na mers man mata gwe ane nefesas zang gineti papa as Leon Guerrero da tutuhon na takan basni. Afafana si Leon Guerrero tres na kwentan primet dan segundo grado na criminal sexual conduct dan attempted first degree sexual conduct. Di mas asunto, Secretary of Labor si Marty Walsh ang manayong rato na conference and media para ay Western and Pacific na lugar na reporters gi Egan Metkulis at sogyasti para o explica ay manalik at the American Jobs Plan. Mafaisan si Walsh kung sinya confirma na guaha sa lapigin na the American Jobs Plan para guaha sa ni pumalo siya na teritoryo ni Estados Unidos. Tia opizu direktamento si Walsh. Doi leng niya na adzo na plano sa na masa de lanto sa na fakmalik adzo siya ay manbaba na infrastructure kung manak mas nwebu ay tinatidzing komunidad siya sa upepare ekonomiya para 21 na siglo. Mensa sa na guaha pun mizon mas na sotso union siya no sen maulik man manapasi. Yutu mo na suntu. Adi USS Springfield sa masunibu na submarine ni para o agang guahan gumaan niya. 
Binido i bet koni delgado ng Michael San Nicolas gi Naval Base Guam. Ilang yan ay natisa esti esta singko na submarine guini. Hasanga na siya ta kontinua para tanak mas medgo di tanota sa nindi defendi ni nasyon no esti siya na kapasidad submarine no ma bansa mas gi fetsan niya. A binido loko yung marino siya sa nifamilan niya no natsasafu mas esti na para iso gi tano. 150 na marino mangga gi USS Springfield. Este na barco no category ng Los Angeles class fast track submarine sa gay kapasidad para suporte mega na misyon siya tagi anti submarine warfare, anti surface ship warfare, strike warfare, and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Para Guam News Network, Guam Second Conception. Yasuto yung finut sa moro sa presenta sa ni nafatto ni familia Mizo gi First Hawaiian Bank. June makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. A fact not lost on Daryl, whose brother Byron is cooking the onaga he caught at a secret fishing spot with his girlfriend Malia, who used to work for the Shave Ice Guy, whose second cousin Vince drives the school bus ridden by Calais, whose auntie makes the best malasadas in Hawaii. Everything here is connected, and with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile lab, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. We got your six. At 6 a.m. with the link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you current? need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six. Family platter of fried chicken? Check. Tray of red rice? Check. Birthday cake? Check. One case of water? Check. 12 pack of beer? Check. Two cases of Pepsi? Check. When you have a long checklist but are short on time, we got you. Get it delivered by us. Order on the app or website at uno-go.com. Guam on demand. Shoot, I forgot the paper product. Oh wait, UnoGo has that too. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. KUAM Communications continues our perpetuation of our Tsamoro culture, language, and heritage with features available to our listening and viewing audience including streaming of Tsamoro music 24 hours per day on Isla Digital Radio on KUAM.com and the KUAM News app. Tsamoro News Update, weekdays on the link and the KUAM News YouTube channel. Conversations about life in our Tsamoro language podcast with Tosta Paco with Kin Conception. Seasonal specials, shows and other features highlighting the beauty of our language, culture, and history. It's a new era of our continued commitment to our tomorrow heritage. Isla, watch, listen, stream. Viva Isla! At any given moment, anyone can get infected with COVID. We've heard it many times over that it doesn't discriminate, that we're fighting an invisible enemy. We're all on the front lines, and I take that to heart. I wanted to do my part, not just for the community, but also for my family. I couldn't bear the thought of bringing COVID home and infecting my son. I also wanted to travel, be able to see my parents and my brothers who I haven't seen in over a year. Now I get it, we all have to make a choice. So whatever you decide, weigh the risks and do what you feel is right. I'm Sabrina Salas Matanani, and I am a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination, scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. 
Catch SportsLink on the KUAM News Morning Show, The Link, every Friday to hear about the latest in sports news, game schedules, athlete profiles, and more. SportsLink, brought to you each week by Cure Alkaline Water and Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, airs every Friday across the multimedia platforms of KUAM. Tune into the broadcast on Breeze 93.9 FM on KUAM TV 11, live streaming through the KUAM News Facebook page, or view highlights on YouTube, KUAM News Facebook, and Instagram. SportsLink is hosted by Dave Delgado through KUAM Sports, and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. The world of television is more exciting than ever. Don't miss a minute of special presentations from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the fun and excitement of award shows and red carpet moments, special series presentations, and other great network programs. Brought to you locally by King's Restaurant, Ruby Tuesday Guam, Bud Light Seltzer, and Docomo Pacific. Giving you more reasons to tune in and turn on. Fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. The relationship between Guam and Manila, Philippines is undeniable as we share similar cultural traditions, history, and heritage with generations of Filipinos calling Guam home. KUAM presents a monthly look at the capital city featuring in-depth and engaging interviews on everything from medical tourism to new business and government leaders. Veteran newscaster Nestor Lecanto delivers Beyond Our Borders. This special program is brought to you by the Bank of Guam and KFC. Help us celebrate the class of 2021. KUAM wants to help you celebrate this touchstone moment in the lives of your graduates. For the months of May and June, we will flood the social media pages of KUAM with photos and well wishes for the class of 2021 grads. Log on to KUAM.com to submit photos and brief messages or captions. Then look for your special grad on KUAM Instagram and the Facebook pages. From all of your friends here at KUAM, congratulations, seniors! You know, I've always said that one of the uh, vantage points on our on our island where you can probably get the very best view is up at the airport. Whether you're arriving or whether you're departing, you get that nice signature shot of basically Tuman Bay all the way down to Agani Bay. And I think our friend John Kanata, the executive director, probably has got a pretty good view of the island from uh, from his office. I, I would say, Jakey, was that is that the case? 
I can I definitely look out my office and uh, see uh, the view. Uh, there is some obstruction, but um, you know, if I make some adjustment to where I'm at, that yes, uh, I will be um, uh, looking at Tumon um, and definitely a beautiful view from, from my standpoint. That's a great way to start the day. And then if you turn around 180 degrees, you can look at the tarmac too, I'm right. assuming. <laughs> Yeah, I, from my office, I cannot see the tarmac. Um, <laughs> it's, it's blocked uh, by the uh, third floor corridor. Ah. And they're going to build something across from the airport, right, uh, JQ? It's uh, What's that store? There's some chain store that they're going to build, right? What The what store? There's like a chain store they're going to build across the street from the airport. I think it came up last year. I forgot already what it is, but that's probably going to further uh, obstruct your view a little bit. <laughs> Maybe I, I, I there was a um, um, there was a plan to build a hotel there you go. Uh, yeah. in that area, but uh, as of this day, I don't think that plan has gone uh, forward since uh, COVID uh, came in. Okay, so. right on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to ask real quick, JQ, because um, you know, we I was asking you during the break, and I was like, I just wanted to get confirmation because it's GVB that actually keeps the official stats and ultimately publishes like the the data and the reports on. Uh, how many people are coming and going, but just from, again, from your perspective, um, how does it seem the foot traffic uh, has, I'm assuming it's increased in the last like few weeks of just the number of people you see like uh, go in and out of the terminals, correct? I, I will tell you that uh, since the uh, protocols have uh, changed, um, the amount of uh, arriving passengers and departing passengers has uh, risen, so it it, uh, it has increased. So uh, definitely, we're start starting to see uh, the amount of traffic, and then also we're starting to get airlines to start um, requesting uh, for uh, space again here at the airport. Uh, so that's a sign that uh, they're starting to plan to start flying in. Outstanding. Uh, JQ, what about uh, the the process of um, verifying vaccinations for incoming travelers so that they can uh, skip out on the quarantine? We're hearing it's a it's a little backed up. Is that what you see too, or no? Well, the the uh, protocol or the processing um, we've we've uh, modified the processing here at the airport. So before, when you come in, uh, you'll go to your baggage, get your baggage, and then you line up. Now, when you come in, uh, you go straight to processing. And uh, basically, at processing is when they validate if an individual has been vaccinated, uh, where have they been vaccinated. If they've been vaccinated on Guam, they have the ability to go into the web site and uh, validate that through WebIZ. Uh, if they've been vaccinated elsewhere uh, out of Guam, uh, they would uh, request for their vaccination card and a secondary document to show that uh, where they got vaccinated is is really uh, uh, true and correct. Do you think that uh, when they stand up that QR code thing on the public health side that it would just uh, make it a lot quicker? I think so. I think the goal is once that, that is stood up and is working uh, the way it's supposed to, uh, those processing tables will probably be um, taken away right. where that uh, the QR code will show exactly uh, individuals uh, health uh, health uh, uh, record and uh, vaccination uh, validation. Uh, what's the protocol for seeing people off or uh, greeting uh, arrivals? Has it changed uh, as we're ramping towards normalcy? For for departures. Uh, we are allowing three uh, well-wishers per passenger uh, to go into the airport. Of course, you know the Chamorros, right? They're very creative. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they'll befriend someone outside and uh, say, hey, I'm with this passenger. But, but we're, we're not really strict on it uh, until we get into the airport and we see a lot of a big congregation. Right. And then, then we start to um, request that they, you know, they follow the uh, protocols. But uh, for arrivals, uh, it's still the same. They cannot come into the uh, arrival section because of the uh, folks uh, co-mingling uh, in that area. So they, they would have to be waiting outside where the uh, concrete uh, overhang is at. 
And that's something that you haven't had to deal with for a while because arriving passengers for the last year have been going straight to quarantine. That's correct. So, so we do have uh, folks uh, when when the folks are being um, uh, taken over to the uh, transportation uh, uh, bus that they're going to be riding in. Uh, there's the ability to see them, but you cannot have any direct contact. So there's maybe about uh, 15 feet of. Uh, um, uh, space between the passengers being uh, uh, let out to the buses uh, versus the people coming in. They're still able to see their their um, loved ones or their their friends that are coming in, but uh, no physical contact. Are you are you privy at all, JQ, to the discussions or uh, with Jeju Airlines? I I, I can't. Uh, are, I are didn't you, get what you said. Are you privy to the discussions that uh, GVB is having with Jeju Airlines about uh, when we reopen tourism? I have not. Um, I, I was not in that discussion, so I don't know exactly what uh, they've talked about. Uh, we do know that um, Jeju Airlines is uh, one of the airlines that are um, are um, requesting for uh, space uh, so that they can start. Uh, having their their um, uh, planes start to come in. Uh, there's also uh, Starlux that has um, uh, requested DLT uh, um, DLT uh, uh, authorization. So that's in the process. Any other airlines? Just those two. Uh, we got Jin Air, of course, uh, Philippine Airlines uh, that that uh, continues to come in. Engineer comes in once a once a week on Wednesdays, and of course United Airlines are are airlines that continue to operate uh, since ever since. Uh, even with the COVID shutdown, they were, they were at least operating the Honolulu and Narita flights, and then uh, also they included the Philippine flights uh, coming in four times a week. Have we seen uh, the number of flights out of out and into Guam increase over the last couple of months? Yeah, so like I said earlier, with when uh, Jason asked that question, yes, since the protocol uh, changed on May 15th, uh, we've seen an uh, increase in um, in uh, passenger arrivals. Uh, right on. So, what do you think, JQ? I mean, you've been around the block. Are we are we heading back to normal or what? I think I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I see. Um, uh, interest, uh, and then with this Airbnb that's uh, coming in, we I've started to see um, uh, expats that are coming in to take advantage of uh, getting vaccinated uh, here on Guam. Um, I know uh, through there there is a discussion once uh, the governor gets the approval. Um, there's there's a, a bunch of expats that are in Taiwan that wants to come to Guam. So they're trying to set up uh, uh, some flights to come here uh, from Taiwan. Yeah, yeah, JQ, I got another question because I, I remember as long as I've been alive, you know, the airport, even going back to like the old airport days, you know, the institution of the Guam airport, um, you know, it always kind of carried with it like, you know, it was a social experience because like you said, you know, the Chamorro custom is, you know, um, if your Nino is going off on a trip, even for like three days, you know, you bring all the cousins and, you know, your, your godbrothers and your godfathers because, you know, you want to wish him well. And when somebody comes back, you typically have like a big uh, welcoming ceremony. And then post 9-11, um, there was this very uh, concerted effort to make sure that it was that was safe and everything was, um, you know, by the numbers and by the book. And, you know, I know with your military experience, uh, you've certainly continued that tradition. Um, but as the as the leader of the airport um, and from your executive standpoint, how do you actually begin to transition your staff and your team and everybody that's you know working in their various capacities, the vendors, you know, the uh, the federal partners, the local staffers, what have you, um, to return to a somewhat normal operational tempo, you know, when tourism begins to reopen again? Because I'm sure that's going to be at least a little bit of an awkward transition, given that you know things have been kind of like so slow for the last 15 months. Yeah. So. So we know that uh, uh, just like 911, you know, things change and that changed for permanently. And that I think that's what's going to happen with COVID. So one of the issues that we're uh, that uh, Customs and Border Protection is implementing is called the biometric system. Mm -hmm. Biometric system now is that, uh, you know, as far as the person to person contact uh, coming in, uh, it's going to be less where uh, individual can come in. 
uh, check in, uh, and instead of checking into the counter, it's ba uh, based on their their facial uh, recognition. Uh, based on that facial recognition, it'll give you your um, your boarding pass. It'll give you your um, baggage claim tickets. Uh, then you go over to baggage claim, where you're going to turn in your baggage to TSA, and it'll validate that you're the person turning in that that luggage uh, that's uh, on that uh, ticket. Then you go over to TSA and uh, you know how you go into TSA and they, they take your passport and they uh, they validate that? Well, uh, if the biometric system uh, works properly, you don't even need to have a person there. It, it, uh, it um, looks at you um, through facial recognition again and then the, the, uh, the, the gate will open uh, for you and then you go through the system. Even when you're when you're uh, boarding the aircraft, uh, it does that. It, it checks you in based on your um, based on your uh, facial recognition. Then arriving, uh, if you're coming in from a third world country or a, a foreign country, not a third world country, but a foreign country, uh, you'll be able to capture uh, yourself uh, through that system. And if you've been in, in the U.S. before, it it uh, already keeps a a. a um, uh, data on yourself and you'll be able to speed up the process hmm. in coming in. So less, less contact, uh, person to person contact is, uh, in the future. Have have your staff indicated at all that, and they're like, Hey, you know, boss, you know, JQ, um, it's, it's admittedly been like a little, a little weird, although we're really excited about it when, you know, um, we see maybe a flight of maybe a hundred, 150 people, you know, like get off the plane and disembark. And then, you know, we have to process them. Cause I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, people were saying, you know, we need a whole crew to be able to facilitate and run people through like a flight that maybe had like two or three people on it. So is 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 the volume and everything like that? Is that some uh, is there a transition period? Yes. But, you know, uh, in the beginning, you know, we were just learning right the process. We're just as we go along, we start to to uh, adjust to things. So um, we're we're doing uh, much more with much less people now because mm. we, we, we've streamlined the process. So yes, you're right. You know, we, you're right, Jay, in, uh, in the beginning, we're doing like 20 passengers and uh, 777 aircraft and stuff. So now we're experiencing uh, average of 220 passengers per, per plane now. So it's really drastically picking up. Oh, okay. And you know, uh, real quick, since I mentioned vendors um, a couple moments ago, um, our are all vendors inside the airport uh, operational right now? And and if not, when when will they return? Like say like you know the snack shop or like some of the some of the places where people can eat. So so what we've done, uh, we know that not all the food court uh, uh, vendors can open up because there's not enough passengers to to uh, to keep them um, employed or you know even busy, even enough to pay for just their uh, their um, um, out wage and hours for the uh, folks that are working. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we're rotating the uh, vendors, uh, still able to have a vendor open in twenty in the twenty four hour period. We have different vendors that are open um, to stagger them so that uh, at least we have some vendors that are open to support not only the uh, passengers but the people that are working there at the airport. Uh, so yeah, they're not all open at all, at the same time. However, we're allowing them to, um, and we've scheduled them so at least one vendor is open. Uh, to support uh, folks that are uh, transiting or are, are leaving or people that are working at the airport. Okay, right on. Well, what about, uh, we already asked you about your, uh, you, you guys got funding, federal funding, right, to uh, augment operations at the uh, airport? Yeah, so so we had, uh, what in the beginning, the first funding we had was, uh, uh, was the CARES Act. And the CARES Act uh, gave us about $20 million uh, in funding. And that's just to keep the airport open and uh, keep it running and, and so forth. Uh, even with that, we are drastically short in, in the budget. So we had to make sure that we cut down a lot of our contracts. We cut down a lot of the uh, uh, procurement, uh, only critical uh, things that we needed to purchase that we had to do. Uh, things that we need to purchase to make sure that we keep the airport safe and secure. Uh, so we drastically cut those um, down. So we got $20, $20 million uh, in the CARES Act. And then for the second, uh, the CRISA, uh, we were able to get $5 million. So 
it, it, it's a little, it's enough to keep us going. Uh, whole, although uh, we are not, not far short of what we need. Uh, so, so on this, um, on the American rescue plan, uh, we have not gotten yet what we're, we're uh, projected to get. And we don't even know what that is yet. Uh, FAA has not um, uh, finalized exactly uh, what the airports are going to get. So we're, we're still guessing at this time. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, lost revenue. We've submitted um, we've submitted our lost revenue um, request to the governor, um, and so for her to consider, and hopefully uh, we'll get something from that. Are you? We don't know yet because uh, the final the final um, uh, guidance from the federal government is hasn't hasn't been received yet. Right. Are you able to tell us how much you guys requested and uh, what it'll be used for if you get it? Well, what we requested uh, to the um, to the governor for lost revenue. This is lost revenue, not for budget going forward. Mm. Uh, for lost revenue, we requested thirty five million dollars, in excess of thirty five million, and that's not only for this fiscal year, but last fiscal year and this this fiscal year. That's not including FY twenty two. Wow. Uh, just so strictly for lost uh, revenue, huh? Yes, 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 sir. Okay. You got to remember that we had, uh, like what you guys uh, mentioned, the vendors that were here at the airport. Uh, those folks, of course, uh, struggled because there was not enough passengers coming in. And so we, that, that that's lost revenue that we had. Plus, uh, the airport runs on uh, uh, in-plane passengers, so departing and arriving passengers is what uh, drives the uh, airport budget. Right, right. So it took a big hit there, Jay. You oh, good? Well, real quick, uh, Jakey, we did have one question because, uh, uh, you know, and since you brought up the uh, the food vendors again, um, Dev Test Jay Salas was asking us on Facebook, um, does your rotating of of the food vendors or the vendors, uh, does that also include the retailers? Um, on the retailers, that's uh, Lote uh, Duty Free. So they, they um, are are open uh, and I, I don't think they're open at the, the like the midnight hours when when uh, you got flights that come in uh, for example Narita and stuff but they do uh, open up to about I think 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, but not all of them are open uh, just uh, certain certain areas of the um, merchandise areas are open oh, okay yeah, it was it was kind of if I can just throw something in my own family's kind of like tradition, if you want to call it that was like whenever we took like a flight going out, everybody stops at the bookstore, get a book, a comic book to read. And right, like right. my mom, my dad, my sister and I and everything. And, and that's that's how they kept us quiet. On I, the always, flights. I always grab a Whopper. Oh, Yo, yeah, we do. Right? That. I have a Whopper. Oh, I got the then, French toast sticks, bro. Yeah, I get the Whopper and then I, you're right. I go over to bestseller and get like a magazine that I read. <laughs> I always right. finish reading it before the plane even takes off. <laughs> <laughs> never fails, never fails. Well, JQ, uh, anything in closing you want to add that we, that we forgot to ask? Because Sabrina's not here, so I feel like this is a fluff interview. <laughs> not a problem. Well, you know, um, thank you, Guam, for uh, for all those folks that are getting vaccinated. You're, you're part of making it, uh, sure that, you know, uh, for us to open up our island, uh, you're, you're part of the, uh, you're the piece of the puzzle that's making us successful in doing that. Uh, and I encourage everyone to try and get vaccinated so that uh, we can uh, get the percentage up in our herd immunity. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we all we all got to get together and be one, as a team. Yeah, don't forget, you can register to win uh, $10,000 or a brand new car. Yep. Uh, Jay, what is it again? Yeah, it's going to be uh, next Wednesday. So yep. you've got six days now at uh, 721 in the morning. And right. you want to go to visitguam.com slash V-A-X, if you have been vaccinated at any point. Right. There you go, JQ. Make sure you register. <laughs> I, I, I'm i uh, ineligible. Oh, yeah, that's right. Cabinet, cabinet members. Uh, I just wanted to rub it in your face a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? As, as we said at the top of the interview, he does have that wonderful vista that he can look he does, out. So yeah. I think that's a fair trade. Thanks, up for it. Thanks, JQ. <laughs> All right. You guys have a good day. That's that. Be safe. Appreciate it. Right on. Uh, John Kanata, Guam International Airport Authority, General Manager.
Uh, we had, you know, Minority Leader uh, Senator Chris Duenas on uh, earlier in the show, and he was talking about when these agency heads go before the legislature and um, talk about, well, actually they don't talk about uh, how much money they're getting or they're asking the governor for from the American Rescue Plan. But I just wanted to say, and I forgot to mention this when he was on the show, is that every agency head that has come on this show, we have asked, hey, how much are you asking the governor for? And they told us. You know what I mean? Maybe it's because we're like less intimidating as senators, you know. And then Bree and I, Bree and I, got that good cop, bad cop vibe going. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we heard just right there from the airport. So senators, write that down. I think Senator Shelton is the airport oversight, right? So if you're wondering uh, what the airport is requesting, uh, thirty-five million in ARP funds, and any of the other agencies. I mean, you can go on uh, the YouTube, right, Jay? Yes. And we post all the interviews from the link on our YouTube page. And I'll tell you guys, if you're really trying to wade through this budget process, especially if you're a senator or a staff, comb through these interviews and you'll find that, you know, we've asked everybody who's come on, hey, how much you asked for the governor for? And for the most part, they've given us that amount mm -hmm. and then also told us what the request was for. So maybe it's a case that you catch more flies with honey. I'm not sure. You know what? We got a special treat today, Chris. Oh, we do. Yeah, we, we were just at the airport. We're going to oh. go kind of like hang a little bit of a left and go about maybe three miles over to uh, Barragata at the Guam National Guard headquarters because uh, we have had our friend Captain Mark Scott on, you know, dozens of times by now. He has always been in civvies. You know, he is a captain. Oh, darn, yeah. He's got the two bars, but look look at what we have now, like uh, in his uniform. You, let me tell Ten you. Hut! Let me tell you, uh, Cap, Jason loves a man in uniform, so we definitely <laughs> definitely appreciate you coming on. You want to stand up, though? So, yeah, so he, was, he was just showing. So what, what, <laughs> He doesn't want to stand up. Yeah, so, hey, Cap, Cap, you were just showing us your, that was the Guam Guard badge, right? The, you... Yeah, I stand up, but I charge modeling fees, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Give us a this run is through. Guard pass, Jason. Yes. Okay. Yep, representing the island. There you go. That is valuable, man. That's highly sought after. Yeah, and, so and you know what? You have to earn that. Yeah, it, uh, this is a highly sought after patch. If you go anywhere in the world, uh, you know, people want to trade for it. They want to trade their whatever, special forces, ranger, mm -hmm. because the Guam patch is just so cool. Well, can you can you do? I mean, you can do that obviously informally, and you know you can have it, you know, exchange with you know like your comrades, or even maybe if you work with a with a military member from like um, you know another national military. Obviously, you can't wear it, but um, you know when when our guardsmen you know go out throughout the world and you know they perform their duties and everything like that, um, how sought after is that is that patch? It's just about as sought after as our barbecue is. So we have a reputation out there. Uh, we've deployed a lot over the years. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> We've deployed a lot over the years, and a lot of people know who we are. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, our reputation precedes us, not just for working hard, getting our hands dirty, working like a family, like a team, mm -hmm. and, and barbecuing. Uh, but they all want the Guam patch, too, because uh, we're just like that. Oh, that's cool. Because I, I, I actually had a friend who went to a special forces training. So he was a Green Beret. And he said everywhere he went, people were like, dude, let me have your Green Beret. And he's, like, he's like, no, you have to earn this. <laughs> Did That's he, right. did he let you try it on at least, Jay? No, he's, he's like, he's like, you can look, but he's like, he's like, if you touch, you know, <laughs> you're gonna wake up next Tuesday and you're, you're not. Yeah, you're gonna get your wrist broken at 85 yeah. places. Uh, you know, Mark, let me. I don't know what to call you, Captain or Mark, because you're in the uniform. It's kind of throwing me off. Always Mark, Chris. Uh, Mark, Mark. So let me tell you. You know what's funny about the barbecue? Because you mentioned like your the guard is so known, right, for the barbecue. Isn't it funny when you go around in the world and you realize? How many people never thought to marinate barbecue meat in soy sauce and vinegar? Isn't it crazy? Yeah, it's the simplest thing, but it's just the best. I know. It's like, it blows a lot of people's minds. There's yeah. These two ingredients made that magic. They're like, oh, what is yeah, that? What is that, man? What is that? What kind of spice are you putting in there? Dude, it's soy sauce and vinegar and an onion. <laughs> oh, you actually tell them? I tell oh, them yeah. it's an ancient tomorrow secret. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I got to start saying that. Uh, nine o'clock. So you guys have uh, uh, you came out of the release yesterday, and I kind of like the way this sounds. It's the vaccination strike team. That's bad, isn't it? That's I cool. Was that your idea? I know. I wish. I, huh. the task force medical came up with it. I just ran with it. There you go. But uh, you know, it, it markets well, and it, it kind of reflects what we want to do is is lean forward and stay aggressive. So now that the numbers at the clinic, the field house clinic, have stabilized dropped a little bit 
uh, you know, we don't like to uh, sit around and be idle and watch people work for our money. So we're leaning forward and we're reaching out to the community. And the way it works is, Chris, if you have an agency, a government agency or a business or even a community organization with about 50 people or more, don't call us for like 10 people, please. But if you got a group of people and you want us to come to you, just give us a call. We can accommodate you. We'll make it safe. We'll make it sanitary. We'll make it more convenient uh, for you and your employees. Um, even your employees' families. We can all work out the details and the logistics. Just give us a call, we'll come to you. And uh, I can give you that number too, Chris, if you let me. Yeah, of course. No, no, give me the number, Mark. Yeah. I don't want it. No, 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 we're good. We're good. All right, never mind then. Yeah. Have a good day. What is it? No, it's 682 2172. And uh, again, if you have a group of 50 agency business, whatever, call 682 2172. There's a poor lieutenant who has issued that phone. She has to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> and she'll talk to uh, the scheduling and the logistics. So it's just one? another way for us, Chris, to you know help keep the community safe, right. meet the governor's goals of uh, getting herd immunity and doing our part. So let me just get this straight as a rewind because I was looking at the Facebook when you said it. So the VAC strike team is basically any business group, organization of 50 people or more. They call this number, they register or whatever, and then you send the strike team out to their location and put all those needles in the arms? Yeah. Hey, Joe, sir, can you turn up Chris a little bit? I have, to have a hard time hearing him, but um, it might just be my ears. It's probably yeah. good. Yeah. I, I, thanks. Thanks, Joe, sir. I think you said it right. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you have a business agency, a community group of about 50 or more, if it's 49, we're not going to shut it down. <laughs> right? Yeah. Give us a call. You can hit up that phone number, 682-2172. You can DM me on Instagram or Facebook at the Guam National Guard. And we'll just link you up with the team. They'll talk to you. You know, if you got a parking lot, they'll come survey it. We'll we'll look at the logistics and see how the traffic would best flow. Uh, we've been at places like the mall. We've been at the port. Uh, we've done 15 of these so far. Vaccinated about 1,500 people. Um, so we understand not everyone wants to take off and go through the hassle of the field house to be more convenient uh, to come to you than, than just give us a call. What's the turnaround uh, time, Mark? Or is this something, I mean, because it's, it's relatively new. You've mentioned you did it 15 other times before, but it wasn't exactly through this process, right, of the VAC strike team where you call the number and the register and all that? Yeah, we like to do like pilots and test runs first just to make sure we don't uh, step on our own toes. So we've tried it out enough to know uh, that we can make it work. The team has re well rehearsed and uh, everything's in boxes. They get the call. Um, the turnaround time, Chris, will depend on how many requests we have. So it will probably change. Obviously, the long line is uh, may wait a little bit longer. Right. But right now, it's just a few days. Um, it's not that long. Um, they take those boxes and they roll out and they set up canopies. They got music on Bluetooth and they'll have a good time for you and your staff. Refreshments? Let's go, Chris. Let's go bring a cooler. Right on. I'll bring the cooler. You can buy the drinks. Can you get me on base? Wait a second. Bring me the cooler. Over there. <laughs> now, I know you guys got big coolers at the guard there. Uh, Mark, so how many... I can get... Go ahead. How many calls have you guys got? Uh, so you, you stood this up, what, yesterday, the day before? The phone number first published in the JIC, I'm going to say two days ago. Okay. Um, I don't know how many calls she got, um, but we'll see after today. Right. She's probably going to get a bunch. So it's, I know there's a lot of community. There, there's community groups out there, like we did a, a Palauan community group. And um, other community groups may represent uh, parts of our population that don't have the same access to go to UOG, or they don't have the same mobility. So in, in cases like that, uh, we like to provide those options. Are there any types of groups, uh, Mark, that aren't uh, going to be able to be visited by the VAC strike team? Churches? Are Not they that I can think of. You know, uh, other than that group number of, we're trying to hit at least 50 people. Yeah. You know, uh, if you have a family of 10, that's not real. That's not really um, a great use of the team's time. But if you can gather 50 people, I don't see any uh, reason on the top of my head why we discriminate okay. against you. Right on. And that includes KUAM. Come on, uh, give us a call. Right on. So we got our own music, though. <laughs> yeah. 
I know you do. And you guys are almost all vaccinated anyway. I've right. seen all you at the field now. Uh, Mark, I mean, so much of uh, what we hear about the Guard doing has been relative to the vaccination effort, which I have to say was has been so tremendous. I mean, you guys have been integral. Um, you've been in day in, day out. I mean, I feel like you guys are a big, if not, well, yeah, you're the biggest part of why we have so many people vaccinated. Well, Chris, you know, we train for this, and I'll, I'll tell you, these soldiers are amazing. It's the same group of people who you see out, you know, when it's time to put the chairs away at the fiesta, when it's time to help in the yard, when it's time to help in the kitchen. People just roll up their sleeves and get to work, and we take care of business. You know, it, it's not just the guard and, and our leadership. It, it's our partners, the, the folks at Public Health, the folks at UOG, all the AmeriCorps volunteers. You know, we're all cut from the same cloth here in Guam, and we all get it done. So as much as I want to take all the credit and the guard, uh, you know, uh, we, we really couldn't have done it all without the people of Guam and all of our partners. So thank you guys. Hey, Cap, I got a question. Um, I, I, I won't trouble you for like the hard numbers if you don't have them, but um, over the last year and a half or so, um, do you know if there has been an uptick in, in enlistments? Because I, I, I only ask because I know in years past, like when we would have like that that rash of um, typhoons like in the early 90s and then again like in the late 90s they would see they would see Guamanians would see the guardsmen going out there and you know passing out water you know cleaning up villages um, dancing in the intersection yeah you know directing traffic and everything like that and that would motivate a lot of people to say like wow you know these guys are these guys are, are taking care of their island and they're stepping up when they're needed and I want to do that so it has has the pandemic and and the guards response you know elicited um, you know like a lot of people um, taking up arms we saw a little drop this last year, uh, Jason. We saw oh, a little drop in our uh, recruitment just because our recruiters haven't been able to do a lot of the things they normally do, like go out into the schools, uh, you know, make visits out into the community. All those things were shut down for the past year. But we did see some come through, and it's starting to pick up again, mm, okay. which if you let me segue into the next thing I'd like to say, right on. we have a job fair coming up this Saturday. Uh, we want to get everybody back to work. Well, we're looking to jumpstart the economy, restart the economy, and get back to normal. So on um, this Saturday at the Agani Shopping Center, Guam National Guard, uh, the Army Recruiting and Retention Battalion is hosting a job fair. It's from 11 to 3. It's not just the Guard. There's a lot of other businesses going to be there, too. So if you want to get back to work, if you want to start making some income again, go down to the field. Uh, I'm sorry, the field house. Go to the field house, too. Get yeah. your shot. But for the job fair, go to the Agani Shopping Center. Okay. No, um, no, when it, um, up, oh, oh, Mark, do these jobs pay more than the PUA, though? <laughs> Doesn't matter. You got to get off the couch, you know? You got you to gotta get moving. And hey, bro, PUA doesn't give you base privileges, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know people during the pandemic wrong. are probably like, couch too. Hmm, PUA, I'm getting yeah. there versus sign my life away, but get to go in the commissary. You know? You know, Cap, since you bring it up, so what, what kind of career opportunities are available in the Guard? Because, you know, I, I like how you kind of like said, you know, our recruiters weren't able to, you know, operate at their normal tempo. Um, but, you know, if you walk down to like one of the recruiting stations, you know, they've got all of, you know, what people might consider naively to be like, you know, like uh, the popular jobs or the sexy jobs. You know, you want to be a ranger. You want to be a Green Beret. You want to be, you know, do all these, you know do all the jobs that, you know, people make movies about and everything like that. But um, obviously the career opportunities in the military, there's a huge range of things you can do based on what the military thinks you can do or what your current skill set is. So like, uh, you know, what are some of the ways that people can, can find a rewarding career in the military? Well, the army in general, Jason has a whole bunch of jobs, probably something like a hundred career fields that you can get on the job training, free education, industry certification, all these things. But just off the top of my head here in Guam, uh, we have career fields that, that that are really productive and they're in high demand uh, out in the community, right? So, for example, uh, we have IT professionals, computer types who do networking, who, who do um, uh, tactical communications, satellite communications. We're standing up a space force with a space control center. Uh, we also have things like uh, engineers who do construction. Uh, right now they're working the ground uh, for Mayor June Blasa Barragata. Uh, vertical construction, doing buildings and infrastructure. Uh, we have the infantry types too. You know, there's a lot of leadership training that comes with infantry too. You're not just going to be a security guard or a cop. You really are trained well on how to lead uh, up to hundreds of people as you progress through your career. And that translates really well into the business world too, right? Because there's 
task organization, there's efficiencies in your workflow. There's, you know, the personal aspect, interpersonal relationships. There's just a lot of opportunities here, you guys. And this is just off the top of my head. I'm sure there's a lot of people here that are going to hate me for missing their job, but um, yeah, I didn't hear potato here. peeler. They play in the army band. Um, <laughs> what else do we got? What do you guys do around here? Cooks, drivers, mechanics, you name it. There it's you just, go. And I, and, and I can say if I, if I can just lend to this, because um, I know that from the tech side, if you've got military telecommunications or IT or you know, network administration like on your resume and everything like that, if you don't land a job at pra practically any private sector company you want, if you've got that on your LinkedIn profile and everything like that, that's rare because like mil military, military communications is really sought after. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we had a little glitch. But I think I know where you were going, Jason, and, and you're right. Employers know that when they get a military applicant, you're getting someone who has some leadership leadership training, some discipline. There's got to be some ambition for you to raise your hand and join this thing and do the difficult things that it takes, right? So right on the baseline, you're getting someone who, who has the makings of a good employee. You add to that, you know, a security clearance, which means a lot. Um, you add to that the free education benefits, which the military offers. Uh, and, and it's like you're getting a professional right off the ground, in other words. All right, we're going to have to send you a bill for a commercial in, in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah, going Saturday, right? be a recruiter after this. Who knows? Right, I know. Uh, Saturday, Ghani Shopping Center, did you say 11 to 3? Yep, 11 to 3, dress up nice, bring your resume, be prepared to interview, and let's get back to work. Right Plus, on. you get that snazzy uniform that uh, Cap's rocking right now. Be a day. You know what I'm saying right here? It's a large now, but I still rock it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw you in the Payless parking lot one time. That's why I asked you to stand up. <laughs> All right, hey guys, Cap. thanks for having me on. Uh, of course, always. Yeah, <laughs> keep in touch. Shoot, my friend. All right. There you go, Captain Mark one. Scott, the uh, Guam Guard. Uh, always a good talk. Nine I think twelve. That's the first time we've seen him in his uniform. Uh, yeah, show. I think so. We're gonna take a break, and we're coming back with drive-by shooting. In Agania Heights, or is it Tatuhan, or was it? No, they said they're not going to change it. Oh, well, yeah, they were mad well, the about that. The survey said they don't want to change it. Right, yep. Uh, I think even uh, former Governor Guterres commented on our KUAM News uh, Facebook article about the place name changes for Agania Heights, and he said, leave us alone or something. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was crazy. I was like, that's a, that's a governor's Facebook. Yeah, okay. Uh, 912, so we'll take a break. We're coming back with Agania Heights Mayor Paul McDonald and Mayor Louise Rivera of Tatuha. Right here on the link. Good morning. After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Mariana's Irrigation and Land landscape and docomo pacific just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with tv again with the best from kuam communications catch sports link on the kuam news morning show the link every friday to hear about the latest in sports news game schedules athlete profiles and more sports link brought to you each week by cure alkaline water and mariana's irrigation and landscape airs every friday across the multimedia platforms of kuam tune into the broadcast on breeze 93.9 fm on kuam tv 11 live streaming through the kuam news facebook page or view highlights on youtube kuam news facebook and instagram sports link is hosted by dave delgado through kuam sports and he will make sure that everyone knows what is happening on the fields, in the gyms, and everywhere in between. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. is a human necessity, one we need today more than ever. And with the new First Hawaiian Bank mobile app, you can stay just as connected to your finances. And it all starts with yes. 
No Go, delivering meals from your favorite restaurants and more, including delivering sodas and adult beverages from the Bottle Shack. Visit uno-go.com or download the app today. Also, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. KUAM Communications continues our perpetuation of our tomorrow culture, language, and heritage with features available to our listening and viewing audience, including streaming of tomorrow music 24 hours per day on Isla Digital Radio on KUAM.com and the KUAM News app. Tomorrow News Update, weekdays on the link and the KUAM News YouTube channel. Conversations about life in our tomorrow language podcast with Tosta Pogu with Kin Conception. Seasonal specials, shows, and other features highlighting the beauty of our language, culture, and history. It's a new era of our continued commitment to our tomorrow heritage. Isla, watch, listen, stream. Viva Isla! As a reporter, I often ask people what compelled them to get the COVID-19 vaccine. For me, someone who's lived through coronavirus, I can't help but fear the idea of possibly infecting others, unknowingly passing it along to someone with a lesser immune system, someone's mother, father, grandparent, or someone who wouldn't be as blessed to suffer only minor symptoms. When I contracted COVID, that is what weighed most on my heart and mind, and that's why I did everything in my power to prevent this from happening, by following public health protocols. And now I am doing the same thing, being mindful my decisions, choices, and actions don't only affect me, but the entire nation. So I chose to get vaccinated, simply to protect others. My name is Adriana Cotero. I'm a KUAM news reporter and anchor, and a proud member of the vaccination. Join the vaccination. Scan and plan. For more information, go to KUAM.com. Brought to you by American Medical Center, your partner in healthcare. Help us celebrate the class of 2021. KUAM wants to help you celebrate this touchstone moment in the lives of your graduates. For the months of May and June, we will flood the social media pages of KUAM with photos and well wishes for the class of 2021 grads. Log on to KUAM.com to submit photos and brief messages or captions. Then look for your special grad on KUAM Instagram and the Facebook pages. From all of your friends here at KUAM, congratulations, seniors! The world of television is more exciting than ever. Don't miss a minute of special presentations from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the fun and excitement of award shows and red carpet moments, special series presentations, and other great network programs. Brought to you locally by King's Restaurant, Ruby Tuesday Guam, Bud Light Seltzer, and Docomo Pacific. Giving you more reasons to tune in and turn on. Fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. Love the way I move your body, girl, so unwind to the sweet reggae music, girl, your mind. Don't worry about the little things, cause girl, it's fine. We said we gonna love you long time, yeah, 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 I love you forever, you're my queen, I'll cherish forever, take my hand, you will see, that you and me were meant, meant to be, yes I love the way I move your body, girl, so unwind, to the sweet reggae music, girl, you're mine, don't worry the little things, cause girl, like it's fine. You said me gonna love you long time. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, 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 I. Yes, I love the way I move your body, girl, so unwind to the sweet reggae music. Girl, you're mine. Don't worry about the little things, cause girl, like it's fine. You said me gonna love you long time. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, 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 I. One second. Put up, throw your 
my addiction be secret for you at night. Huh. Set a love all out forever, together you and I. Uh. Let's join us as one, I will love for I and I. Yeah. Any battles to overcome, go for you, I will die. Yes, I mean, I shining armor, we will fight I right, right. Hey, the Pacific the point. Good morning and thank you. In a very special way. Jack in the box, thank you. IT&E, Cabo Enterprises, thank you guys for sponsoring the link. It's Thursday, June 10th. Good morning. Morning, Jay. Good morning. Uh, coming up, Mayor Paul McDonald of Vagani Heights, and we'll get Mary Louise Rivera of Tattoo Hat. Um, we've also got Cover Me, guys. Go ahead and do that at 920. Uh, it's brought to you by our friends at Burger King. We remember every Wednesday, it's I Love Love the Whopper. Yep, today's not Wednesday. Guess what? It was yesterday. And you know what? It, I mean, just because Whopper Wednesday is the day when you can get a free Whopper by saying that, get Whoppers throughout the week and train your stomach so then if you want to yeah. just jam both yourself, nothing wrong with that. Just go by and say hi. You know, say, hey, what's up? I love, love, love the Whopper. And they'll be like, oh, it's Thursday. I'm just letting you know. FYI, I love the Whopper. Training. Duly noted on the record. Okay, you can also get their new French Toast Breakfast Sandwich available at BK Tumon and Agatnya. It's also brought to you by our buddies over at Docomo Pacific. It's called Cover Me, and you get it every morning here on the link. Good morning. Come be 
6 a.m. with The Link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you points? need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Uh, Sabrina's teleworking out of Las Vegas, but she's actually running around right now doing stuff for her dad, right? Yeah. Uh, 927, Thursday, June 10th, in the KUAM News Zoom Room. All hail to Tuha. Good morning, Tumon Harmon, Mayor Louise Rivera. Good morning, Mayor. Okay, good morning. Right on. Good morning, Jason, Joe, Bree. Good morning, Mayor. Good right morning. on. Uh, good to see you, Mayor. It's always great seeing you every morning. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate the support. Uh, you know, we brought you on. I mean, you know, not uh, unfortunately not good news, but uh, Hotel Mayana and, of course, the tragic uh, stabbing death of Virginia LaGuatnia uh, taking place under your watch in your village, uh, Mayor. Reaction? It was a it was a very sad time. I mean, you know, um, you know, I first saw it on social media about um, how they were looking for someone out there who did the stabbing, and so even at that, um, you know, with that going on, there were other crimes being committed as well. You know, in um, different places, and so um, you know, again, you know, we continue to ask everyone to um, be vigilant of all their surroundings and things going on and, um, you know, to continue to be on the lookout, you know, and help one another. I mean, help people to respect each other, you know, and, um, um, you know, change ways of, of those that are going through um, mental issues. And, you know, with especially like with relationships, I mean, domestic violence, you know, there, there's a lot of that going on. And I really appreciate the different organizations that are coming out to help, you know, those that are in need. Um, and, you know, with this, you know, I, I too am a, a member of Arrow. Victims Advocate reaching out. And so, um, you know, this really, uh, with that incident at Hotel Mayana, the stabbing, you know, it, it really, it really, you know, um, came close to, um, you know, um, to me. I mean, it, it was, a, it was a really sad time for many of us, you know, and um, especially like, you know, those of us that know these individuals. I mean, you know, and and have known that, um, you know, there were issues and it wasn't, um, you know, addressed or, you know, like even with. Uh, even if there's a restraining order, you know, it's not, you know, people still sneak around it, yeah. you know, and, and um, you know, sh they shouldn't be where they are, but, you know, a lot of things are happening like that. And so, again, it's, you know, um, just everybody coming out to help one another, you know, to be on the lookout for things the, the moment they see it, report it, you know, if um, an individual is in the area and we know that they're not supposed to be there report it what right away, you know, and, and uh, you know, try to reach out to all those who can um, prevent things from happening. Mayor, when you talk about uh, while we were dealing with this stabbing death, there were other crimes happening in, in the village. Are you seeing an, an increase now that we're kind of like pretty much back to normal? Um, 
there are, you know, um, different things. Um, you know, I'm not seeing an increase because of, you know, um, things going back to normal. Um, these are, I believe, could be issues of, you know, um, the fact that people are desperate um, for money or, you know, items because of uh, drug-related issues. You know, um, you know, and then again, um, it goes back to the respecting one another and each other's properties. Uh, I know the uh, the neighborhood watch program in all three villages in Tumuning, uh, Tuman, and Harmon, you know, like has seen a lot of uh, traction. Uh, have these recent um, very unfortunate cases have they caused that to uh, ramp up a little bit more? And are you hearing anything from from the residents about you know like let let's share more information or let's, let's really get the neighborhood watch uh, program, um, you know, going more. Um, well, our, with the neighborhood crime watch chats that um, we handle here in Tumani, Tuman and ha Upper Tuman Harmon, um, they're very active and, and, you know, I love that they report, <laughs> even if it's every little thing, you know, somebody's down the street, somebody's yelling, mm -hmm. uh, there's a suspicious vehicle coming by. So they'll ask each other, you know, um, are you expecting any maintenance workers because there's, um, you know, there's a maintenance truck outside your house, you know, things like that, you know, which is great, you know, and the, the, the responding and helping look out for each other is just wonderful. Um, so again, you know, um, also, you know, I always remind them, you know, when you see something, um, you know, a BS posted on the chat, but make sure you also call it into GPD, you know, so um, GPD can come out and respond, you know, as soon as it's, you know, as possible. I know with, um, with uh, the, the stabbing that went on on Sunday, um, you know, there were other crimes being committed and, um, and people were calling for the Guam Police Department to make those reports. You know, but then, you know, they were, they were busy, you know, trying to, um, you know, trying to capture, you know, the, the person who did the stabbing. And so, you know, they were busy all around. And so, you know, um, you know, we did what we can to, to just, um, you know, to, to comfort, you know, the, the other victims of crime and, you know, to let them know that um, GPD will be there, you know, as soon as we have an officer that clears you know, um, we'll continue to work together and see how we can, um, you know, again, help each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm really grateful for those um, homeowners and, you know, residents, tenants of apartments that have cameras, you know, that help capture these individuals and to identify who are causing crime and not respecting, you know, other people's properties. I'm really grateful for that. Mm. Well, you know, a couple of days ago, Mayor, um, you know, Chris, uh, he said, like, you know, his kids were up with their Nana in um, in Jigo. And Sabrina, of course, lives in Jigo. And uh, when this story was breaking, they said they both kind of, you know, sent messages to their kids. And they're just like, hey, everybody just, you know, stay inside. Something uh, really scary is happening. Um, do you get a sense from the children in, in the three villages that you oversee that, um, um you know, there's some trepidation and about, you know, like, like, uh, you know, going outside or being able to, uh, you know, leave their house, even though we, we still exist in a socially distant environment. And what, what can you say as the municipal leader to say, like, you know, our streets sh sh still should be safe while at the same time, you know, make sure that you look after your neighbors. Yes. Um, that evening too, uh, you know, I was with, um, a lot of kids, um, you know, around the neighborhood and, um, you know, they were talking about walking to the store and, um, you know, I guess, you know, some of them were not aware um, that there was someone out on the loose that, you know, they're looking for, you know, that did the stabbing. And so, um, you know, we, we had to make it known, um, you know, to them to, um, you know, to stay with their parents, don't just wander off, you never know what's going to happen. You know, it's just um, being able to talk to them, you know, to, to, 
get people more um, informed and educated on what's going on and uh, what to look out for. But, you know, and then um, there's also those, you know, we have to explain because they're are many that really get affected and traumatized and they're they're scared and so you know we also explain to them that not everyone is bad and there are still good people out there and so you just be mindful of of you know the different individuals out there you know um just be you know be always be careful and you know um you know do what you can to stay safe and you know because you know, still people need to go to the store to get water or, um, the, you know, medication, stuff like that. So just going out there, um, you know, uh, I mean, there's a, a different uh, emotional issues for everyone, Absolutely. you know, and so we have to do our best to try to identify and see how we can help. Okay. Um, and then if we can uh, the, uh, transition uh, just for a moment, Mayor, like as we begin to return to Oops. Okay, and I believe uh, Chris Chris has a caller on the line. Yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring on Mayor Paul in just a minute because it's a very similar issues. Uh, guess what? You got crime in Des Moines. Well, they got crime in Ganey Heights. So, we're, but we're gonna bring on uh, this caller now uh, onto the uh, link. Sir, can we hook, uh, so Mayor can hear? Uh, Mayor, the gentleman here has uh, wanted to just uh, comment on uh, some of the things you were saying about uh, the community response. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just I was, I was just listening to the conversation in regards to helping one another and stuff. You know, uh, uh, my question is, is reporting it to GPD. Often they don't answer my phone call, but when they do answer and respond to, uh, uh, like we all know that Swamp Road in particular has got a lot of junk and stuff over there. You know what I mean? And when they, I, I see it in my own two eyes and I hear it in my own two ears that, oh man, just. Take a look at her. She's she's high on something. Uh, just never mind. They'll, they'll figure it out. So how do we fix that issue? Uh, you're talking about drug addiction, sir. Uh, drug addiction, family violence. A lot of that happened in Strong Road, close to where my uh, my grands are living. You know. Uh, so you're you're basically saying that uh, we're kind of like Munga never mind, right? When we see these issues. I, see it. I, I honestly I swear, I swear, sir. It, it, it makes no sense, you know. We're trying to help one another to be safe, and when, uh, when, when I mean, some of them are doing a great job, but I see it. There, are a couple of them or so just say, "Hey, man, they're, let them sort it out. They're, 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 they're doing something, you know." I mean, what, well, what, what? How can we help one another if they're not going to protect us? You know what I mean? We're depending on them. Thank you, sir, for your call. All right. So yes, I'm sorry to inconvenience anything. Or... No, no, no. It's good. Yeah. Anything else you want to say? Uh, man, God bless all of us and uh, let's help each other be safe. Hey, Amen. Uh, there you go, Mayor. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times in our culture, we don't like to talk about the uh, issues, and it ends up kind of being that. Oh, well, okay, never mind. It's okay, Mayor. No, Mayor. Right on. Let's get Mayor Paul on, too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Louise, we're going to bring on Mayor Paul McDonald along uh, with you guys as we're kind of talking about uh, crime in the villages. And we did want to get on Mayor uh, Paul. Good morning, Mayor Paul. Unmute. 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 Oh, unmute. No, he's good. He's good. Okay, he's good. Um, and so, Hello. Uh, hi, Mayor. Thanks for joining us. Sure. I wanted to ask because we didn't report on this incident. Uh, we'll just get it over with real quick. Was this incident involving uh, Nicholas Moore and a, and a drive-by shooting that took place at Agania Heights Gym back in in October, Mayor uh, McDonald, what what kind of kind of information can you uh, share with us about this incident? You know, uh, Chris, it's uh, actually uh, a very limited information because that night that. Uh, uh, receive a phone call from uh, GPD. Uh, they wanted to to view our cameras, you know, that that we have that uh, have recorded the the situation at that time. So um, we came out here about ten o'clock, and um, we were reviewing the uh, 
the video. <coughs> and um, we found out that it wasn't in the gym, it was outside the, the basketball court. And remember that we still had the COVID uh, uh, rules that were, you know, uh, that were in place. And um, <clears throat> uh, what do you call it? The uh, police never came. And we waited here for about an hour and uh, we finally received a phone call that um, uh, we didn't have to be here. So uh, that was the last time I heard from the uh, police. But, you know, there were rumors that uh, we received of what happened. And uh, actually, I, I didn't um, take those rumors uh, seriously because mm -hmm. the police ain't come to review our cameras. Were you able it, to... it took like a few days before they came back oh. and uh, reviewed the cameras. But we were there that, that night that uh, it happened. Can you describe what, what happened there? That um, <clears throat> there was a, a couple of guys out here at the basketball court and uh, I guess there was, um, um, they suspected that they had an argument and that's, that's the only thing I knew. Did you see any gunshots or any, did you know of any shots fired or anything? What is that? Did you see any gunshots or uh, hear any gunshots? No. On the... no. Anyone injured? No. <clears throat> but that, that, that was the last I heard of that until, you know, rumors from uh, uh, guys that come around. But again, it was very limited because... Uh, um, it was, there was still a curfew on me. Oh, yeah. Did GPD take the footage from your office? What is that? Did GPD take the footage from uh, your office? Yeah, it didn't show. Oh, it didn't show. Okay, okay. It just showed that there were a couple guys uh, here that were, um, were conversing, but we didn't see the gunshot, no. Were you able to identify uh, Nicholas Moore as being on any of the videos? No. Okay. No, it, it was too far I see. from uh, where the cameras were. Right. Can we go back to side by side? Uh, Mayor Paul, I know we're interviewing Mayor Louise, and she's talking about, uh, well, not necessarily an increase, but definitely more visibility with crime happening in the village. Are you seeing similar uh, things in Agani Heights? Very similar. <laughs> You know, uh, Mayor Luis uh, um, brought up about the um, neighborhood watch. We've uh, actually identified some people that were uh, um, committing crimes in, in the store, theft, um, even uh, throughout the, the, the neighborhood. You know, at one time we had... Um, a, a, lady that came in the store and uh, filled up her bag of uh, goodies and um, she just walked out so we had to uh, identify her and uh, the store owner had uh, asked mayor are you gonna how are you gonna identify her and i go well we're gonna put it out on uh, the village chat and if anybody knows her uh, she would be informed so uh, actually, she she was informed and she came back and she apologized and the store not, uh, didn't want to uh, press charges and they go, you know, uh, this should uh, um, deter any um, buddy from <laughs> trying to get in and, and commit the uh, theft. So the good old. And sure enough, you know, the uh, store was. Uh, um, very grateful that we had caught the lady. So it was a good old fashioned and shaming. Yes. Right. But you know, I, I don't hold back, Chris. Um, somebody commits a crime, I, I, 
ask the, the community to come out and uh, try to identify this person. A couple of cars too that we had uh, reported to the police that uh, we have their license plate mm -hmm. number and uh, they tr tracked them down and um, you know uh, they found out who was uh, attempted to uh, steal the uh, bush cutters or actually uh, took the bush cutters and uh, I don't know what happened to them. How about Mayor, Lu Mayor Louise? Do you have a lot of bush cutter theft in Tatua? Do people bush cut in your villages? <laughs> There's a plenty of buildings, that's why. There's a around, um, and yes, we'd like to see them working. <laughs> but um, yeah, don't steal somebody's own. I mean, you know, there's a people willing to let you borrow to go out there and cut and clean and keep the area nice, you know, for everyone to enjoy. Nice, clean neighborhood. What about that? So, uh, now that we got, but it does work. It does, right? Yeah, I I know one of my uncles his bush cutter bush cutter was stolen and he was happy because he's oh, I don't have to bush cut no more. <laughs> <laughs> Come back and take the blower. <laughs> Mayors, I wanted to ask with this American Rescue Plan funding. I know that you guys have put in your request to uh, add a loop, but what uh, what would you guys use these funds for if you were to get them to do improvements in your villages? And we'll go ahead and start with you, Mayor Paul. I actually want more uh, uh, street lights, you know, and uh, more visibility so we can catch these uh, culprits, you know. And then uh, if I can find uh, um, a company that would give us a discount on trying to get cameras for everybody, you know, uh, I know that. Uh, the tamuning is too big and you can't provide everybody a camera, but, uh, you know, that, that's uh, a wish, you know, that I have for Ganya Heights to make it safer. So we can identify all these guys that uh, are willing to, you know, come in and take the chance. But uh, I'm sure that that's going to be a big deterrence, you know, for our community or for the culprits to come in and uh, commit these crimes. Good idea. Mayor Louise, how about you? Oh, well, same thing. Of course, we, we want more street lights for visibility. Um, you, you know, where we are also in dire need of more vehicles to go, you know, get out there. Um, you know, we still continue to deliver food and, um, um, you know, do a lot of work. Uh, maintenance out there on the road and uh, you know if you've probably seen our vehicles you know everything is like from surplus <laughs> and falling apart so th there's a lot of need um, for funding you know for our operations and uh, you know just all over uh, to, to keep the community safe. Oh, uh, oh, Jay you want to answer that? <laughs> All right. Uh, what about stray dogs? We'll just get you on the stray dogs while we got you here. Uh, Mayor Paul? Yes, we have a problem, but our dogs are smarter than the average dogs here in the Ganya Heights. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it may sound funny, Chris, but uh, God, this, we have four traps of our own, and we put it out every day. So the dogs uh, actually... Uh, have a scent that they leave on these traps. You, you catch one dog, you wait a, a couple of months to catch another. You know, uh, and the pigs are not as smart as the dogs. So we catch a lot of pigs. So, you know, uh, feral pigs, you know, and uh, there's only one pig that we cannot catch. That's the pig that was hanging out and on us for. It's a huge, <laughs> but really, it's true. And uh, the, the people that use Nana's uh, store or pass Nana's store every day would, would tell you at one time, this pig would just hang out in the bus stop at uh, 5.30 in uh, the afternoon. Wow. 
That's not a got the really good uh, sour pickle mare, like the yeah, spicy pickle. Have, they, yeah, they got good pickle mare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about, uh, yeah, mare, Paul, you know, that's a big issue too, right? We hardly talk about is the pigs, man. Uh, and I know it was really bad last year. It's like you go, uh, I mean, they're coming out of the jungle, and I don't know if it's because people used to raise pigs and they couldn't keep them anymore, or they run away, <laughs> and then they're breeding with the, the wild pig. But, yeah, there's just pigs all over even in the two hot mayor louise or <laughs> uh, we have had several we're getting calls um you know but uh we have our big traps out there we're trying to capture them i we our staff personally have not captured any pigs but there have been um sites reports on sighting of pigs in certain areas so you know we do have traps available should they need it and want to catch um as for the stray dogs you know we're very active in capturing them we've been very successful our problem is turning it in to gain where there's not, not enough room mm. or closed or you know um <clears throat> they're not ready to receive it from us and so you know we're we get stuck with it and you know have to uh have them just uh here in our compound you know feed them until we can bring it up to game you know so we're, we're calling our chairperson for the mayor's council of guam mayor paco all the time saying you know hey we got dogs and you know we need to turn it in so a lot of times i'll tell them i'll send game doesn't want to receive it i'll bring it down to you <laughs> so put it but, in um, your area <laughs> Yeah. Many dogs. There's, there's, um, what do you call it? Uh, too many dog lovers out there. That, uh, that's, that's the problem. You know, uh, 15 years ago when I, uh, we had the, the, the problem. There was a, a bigger problem then, and uh, when. Uh, <laughs> We, uh, I was the president of the council at that time. We suggested that the only way to get the dogs out is to uh, treat them like pigs, the feral dogs, and uh, get rid of them at once. So at that time, they suggested that uh, um, no, we we have to stay and neuter everything that we. Right. And eventually it's going to come out. I mean, they're going to eliminate them. And I go, I don't think so. Well, here we are today. And uh, they marked me as a dog hater. But, you know, I have four dogs at home that I, that, uh, I treat better than uh, I treat my, myself. And, uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to say kids. <laughs> You know, but uh, that's the truth, uh, Chris. Yeah. Here we are today. There's still many more dogs. Right. Yeah, and so, I, I mean, I, I thought that was interesting. You're right, uh, Mayor Paul, is that uh, Gain has been the one who's come out and said that spaying and neutering is the way to go and that uh, euthanizing the dogs, putting them to sleep is uh, not effective, which I know in a lot of people's mind, maybe they struggle with that making sense because it seems like if you remove... Uh, the strays, especially the bad tempered ones, which is what uh, I think Mayor Jesse was saying uh, they really consider for euthanization. But if you just remove them from the equation, right, I, I don't know what the uh, Gaines argument is that the the space is filled. Yeah. With and there was a or, policy, yeah. Chris. There was a policy at that time that after three days and nobody wants it or nobody claims it. Right. Then you get rid of them. You know, now we have dogs up there that, uh, how many kennels do we have? Are we going to provide more kennels? We're going to spend uh, thousands of dollars to build kennels? Oh my God. You know? And uh, one person that had a problem with that was. Uh, saying that, oh, Mayor, these veterinarians at that time, uh, 
didn't have enough customers. So they're going to have to find a, a way to make money. And, and you know, I go, hey, that, that's, uh, when you think about it, it might be true. And they brought in uh, uh, vets from, from off island to help out at that time. No volunteers and, and look, it still didn't work. No? Well, well, I'll tell you, Mayor, the veterinarians are definitely making money now because now, there's, there's, I yes. mean, it's, it's the backup to get your animal in to see the vet. It's just crazy. So, uh, That's Mayor, right. Mayor Louise, you got just a couple of minutes, but I wanted to get your, your two cents on this. Um, do we need to uh, start discussing whether putting dogs to sleep is a viable uh, part of this stray dog solution? You know, I, I mean, you know, that's a, a very touchy subject, I yeah. guess, because again, there are a lot of dog lovers out there, you know, and so um, you know, if they were doing that with the, the feral pigs and the, the deer. Nadu, yeah. years out yeah. there you know and so um because there is too many that that suggestion has been brought up to me um, brought to my attention that that's what needs to be done um me personally wanting to be the one to do that i mean you know i i need to work with my colleagues and you know everybody to to see um um you know what what we're going to do. I mean, you know, I know that uh, Mayor Alec, our president of the Mayor's Council, has talked about uh, putting, you know, to, you know, to um, see what can be done about that, putting them to sleep, you know, uh, right off. Because there's just too many and they're attacking, you know, um, it's not only the stray dogs that are attacking, you know, uh, pedestrians, people, you know, just going by walking or exercising. These are even um, dogs that are owned that are um, behind their private property fence line and they, they come out, they come out into the street. They, um, you know, they, th even those dogs, you know, those are a great concern as well. So, um, you know, again, um, I um, look forward to this committee being put together because something needs to be done right away, right. you know, and again, kids are back to school, you know, so there's more, you know, um, people out there walking again, you know, trying to get their um, son a vitamin D and all that and, you um, and, you know, gas is getting more expensive, so people are walking and um, out there. And so we really need to do what we can to, that are, you know, um, uh, bothering our pedestrians and, you know, our, our community. Good call. Mayor Paul, thank you for your time this morning. We've got to go, so it's uh, 10 o'clock. So Mayor Louise, appreciate it. Sure. All right. We now adjourn sure. this uh, meeting of the Mayor's Council of Guam. Adios. Thank you. All right. There you go. Okay. I love my dogs. <laughs> He's like, for the record, I love dogs, okay? <laughs> All right, Mayor Paul. Uh, always a good time there with the village uh, mayors. We're going to take a, a quick break, and we're coming back and wrapping up the show right here on the link. Good morning. Family platter of fried chicken. Check. Tray of red rice. Check. Birthday cake. Check. One case of water. Check. 12 pack of beer. Check. Two cases of Pepsi. Check. When you have a long checklist but are short on time, we got you. Get it delivered by us. Order on the app or website at uno-go.com. Guam on demand. Shoot, I forgot the paper product. Oh wait, Uno Go has that too. KUAM's multi-platform morning show, The Link, just got a little more delicious with Feed Me Fridays. Chris, Sabrina, Jason, and the rest of the morning crew will take some time each Friday to talk food, taste food, and bring you all the latest and greatest in food from King's Restaurants and Ruby Tuesday Guam. Old faves, new hits, and everything on the menu in between. It's Feed Me Fridays on The Link. 
After a year with so many games and events delayed or unplayed, the world is ready for anything and everything in the world of sports. KUAM Communications is ready with more games, more championships, and more specials that are guaranteed to bring out the fan in you. Don't miss a minute of gameplay from NBC on KUAM TV 8 or from CBS on KUAM TV 11. Every month, we'll bring you the action and excitement. Brought to you locally by Michelob Ultra, Superior Light Beer, Mariana's Irrigation and Landscape, and Docomo Pacific. Just more great reasons to tune in and turn on so you'll fall in love with TV again with the best from KUAM Communications. And we'll get some uh, people from GCC. How can you go to community college for free the nice. first year? We'll tell you how tomorrow on the show. We're getting Jesse Kang of the Guam Ethics uh, Commission and Sarah Thomas Nettie Dog of the Office of Homeless uh, and Poverty Prevention. All that happening tomorrow morning on the link. Until then, my name's Chris. I'm Jason. Adios. Happy Thursday.